What's up, Coin Conceived crowd? I'm Rob from Velen's Chosen Podcast. And I'm Eve. And I'm Grant. And you're about to hit your first turn for... Coin Conceived. Greetings. Hello. Greet. My greetings. Well met. I greet you. Greetings, traveler. Greetings, friend. The pleasure is mine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 147 of Coin Concede, a Hearthstone podcast dedicated to making the competitive side of the game more accessible to you. Uh, we have a really exciting show this week. We're going over the rest of the spoiled cards from Boomsday. Uh, but before we get into that, let's let's get to know uh, me and our co-host. So from the Maelstrom, Louisiana, it's me. I'm Appa. And joining us from Gadget Sand, New York, it's Ridiculous Hat. How you doing, Hat? I feel like over the course of my time in this show, which I've realized is like a year and a half, that the the listeners probably have gotten to know me. Look, some we we get new listeners. All right. Okay, that's fair. So, so we gotta we we gotta introduce them. Yes. So for those of you that haven't listened to the show before, hi, I'm Hat. Keep prep, except when you don't. <laughs> oh and God! Uh, already. <laughs> and and our, and our other. Hey, Bodicus, I was prepared. <laughs> All right, it's start. It's start early. <laughs> Great. So, so from Karazan, California, we have Bodicus. How you doing? I'm doing good. Well, I was right. doing good, and then Hat introduced himself. Oh my gosh! That's, you know how many <laughs> that's, times I've heard that average. sentence in my life? <laughs> is it is it approximately zero? It's. I'm I'm gonna plead the fifth. It's wait oh, wait, <laughs> wait zero. Hold on, you were giving compliment. Thank you, Appa. Yes, exactly, because you're a wonderful person. Aw, that's nice. Well, All right, anyways. listen, one out of two other Coin Conceit hosts appreciate me. I think Bodicus appreciates you, too. As I long really as we're not talking about crap. You have. Yeah. Well, thank you. I like you guys, too. All right. Anyway, we should, we should do a show. podcast we're, together. Before, before we divert too much. So, uh, we, we have some new patrons this week, which uh, I think... All of us are actually really excited about. We have Lior Y. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If I'm not, please roast me on Twitter or in Discord. I'm very sorry. We have Chris M and Scott K. And we also have a longtime listener of the show and former producer, Viriatus, is back as a producer again. And I am really happy to see him back. Uh, I know he had some personal stuff going on for a while, but I'm, I'm glad he's back and he's in a place where he feels like he can support us again monetarily. So. I, I I think I speak for everybody when I say we're glad to see you back and we're uh, happy that you're doing well. Viriatus, I think you're as majestic as that song. And that means a lot. I was about to say, I think that's the bumper for the wrong set. <laughs> I think it's, that was that was about a year ago with dinosaurs. It's, I mean, but dinosaurs have been long gone. And it's still always time for dinosaurs. It's fine. That that's fair. That's I think that's a shout out to Esperoth right there. <laughs> yes. So uh, speaking of patrons, Coin Concede is supported in large part by you, the listener. If you'd like to find out how you can support us and receive rewards in return, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Coin Concede. We have recently updated our patreon tier rewards not going to go into them every week but if you want to check them out go ahead and do that just follow the link uh check it out in the show notes or from what i just said when i just spoke out of my mouth just type that in your uh, google url bar and uh yeah just check that out because uh we're, we're supported by you we do this for all of you guys all of you let's say all of you because all of you guys that's that's just not accurate so, yeah, we just do this for all of you, and we, we really enjoy doing it, and we really appreciate all the support that we got. Yay. And <laughs> thanks to your contributions, we've managed to make the sound less terrible than last week for the raw listeners and live listeners. I'm going to mark right here. Um, so, patrons, nitty-gritty in the audio. It turns out that desktop graphics cards, are or er, audio cards, are just terrible when they're built into your motherboard in 2018. 
So we didn't learn that because of how the audio was mixed when we were using Skype. But Microsoft's like, hey, you know that useful software you have with, with such features as control your own volume and keep it there? Well, we're going to remove that. And so we switched over to Discord last week. I'm sure you heard about it. And unfortunately, running the mixer directly into the desktop audio card, it made that awful crackling sound in the raw. So you got a little bit of different cut. But we've since, thanks to your contributions, been able to fix that. And so right now we're running off a new USB audio interface that has none of the crackling and overloading. And you should get nice, crisp, clean, raw audio this week. Please definitely let me know if there's anything new that's exciting and wrong or anything old that's always been wrong, and we'll fix it. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for the patrons, if you ever wonder, like, what's my money actually going to? It went to, part of it went to the new microphone uh, that I've had for the past two weeks, so I sound much, much better. Went to Hat's new... Um, interface. W- interface. It's gone to, like, domain hosting and stuff, so it's, like, it's it's super helpful when you guys help us out, and it helps us make better shows so keep doing that thing (laughs) yay all right patron audio section over we miss you we love you and live listeners hey i see you there avantis you're great grandmaster frankasy what's going on steven sensei i'm gonna shout you out later picky mickey thank you for the feedback and uh and i we appreciate you tuning in and hanging out with us late on a Wednesday night, especially you, Avantis, packing for Gen Con, and you want to keep company with your coin concede, we're happy to pack with you any time. That's weirder than I thought it would sound. I'm going to mute. All right, so hat's muted, so I think that's time for me to segue into the ladder section. So how, how, how have y'all been doing on ladder? How did y'all finish the month? Uh, let's go with you, Bodicus, because I know you took a little bit of time off after Oakland, but... I'm sure you still played a little bit. So so how was the end of the month for you? Uh, really, I didn't play a whole lot. I was just kind of clearing quests, and I played a little bit at the Incapers quest, which was this weekend, and was a lot of fun. For those of you who listened to last week, we had bites on, and I made it out there, and it the turnout wasn't as high as I had hoped, but it was still a lot of fun. He put so much work into it and really was a cool cool thing and hopefully he can still put more on and while i was there i got to talk to alec from the golden wisp some of you might remember him but uh he got to talk to him for a bit and he convinced me that i should go to the pre-release this weekend so i was i know i was kind of wishy-washy on whether i was going to go but this weekend i will be going to the pre-release even though it's a bit farther of a drive but should be fun haven't played a whole lot, but excited to start playing a bunch now that the month has rolled over. Try to hit Legend if I can before the set comes out, because then I can mess around a lot or just try hard and beat a bunch of people and hopefully get a high rank so that I can finish well at the end of the month. Yeah, and I, I noticed you on Hearthstone sporadically, but I feel like whenever I got on on my computer and I looked at my friends list, it said Bodicus in Uldaman on Malganus. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this man's just in World of Warcraft constantly right now. <laughs> yeah, we that's that's what we were doing. Yeah, preparing I, I, for a battle for, for Azeroth, which is coming out. So another reason why I want to hit Legend early is so I can kind of be up there and just camp there and play a little bit of ba- battle for Azeroth before the end of the month. Yeah, so, well, and I will take a little bit of responsibility for that because... Bodicus messaged me. He's like, do you know anybody that plays WoW? And I was like, join the guild. We have cookies. And so now Bodicus and I are guildies. And he's he's learned that... I've literally never been able to play with Hat yet, though. <laughs> I joined yeah. his server, so I could be like, oh, maybe one of these nights Hat will be playing and I can join in. But so far, haven't had that opportunity yet. But Hat's had characters we don't need to get into this yeah well you probably notice you log into the wow discord and everyone else is playing wow and it's two in the morning and i'm like building spreadsheets yeah (laughs) Yeah. the the problem with trying to play with hat at any reasonable time i used to be able to do it and test for tournaments because i'd be up at four o'clock in the morning at my parents house in georgia just like being a college student then he'd be like yeah i'm I'm gonna go to sleep in a couple hours wake up like three hours it's like hat what's wrong with you what are you doing what is your schedule yeah well a hat is uh, 2 a.m is a reasonable time for me i'm i'm usually up at 11 anyway because i think he's three yeah. you're three hours ahead right correct yeah though yeah, i so i did a reasonable have a hour for me but i just we haven't been able to connect yet 
And in the past week, I have had, I think, three coaching sessions that started 2 a.m. my time. So it's, it's, it's a weird world. But yes, WoW is coming. Boomsday is coming. So many good games are coming. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good time Mega to be Man gamer. 11 is coming. Oh, uh, yeah. So did you play a lot of ladder this past week, Hat? No. No, I didn't. No. I played, so Mally Ghost Druid. And I, I want to preface this. The sky, I think, is pretty well anchored where it is. And so I have not been playing Mally Druid to ride the skies falling before the the quote-unquote inevitable uh, fluke nerf or whatever nerf you think is happening. I just wanted to learn Mally Druid because it looked fun. And it never clicked for me until I think I talked about this last week until I found Kaiku's Open Summons list. And then I played it and I was like, oh, just a tempo deck. And Botic's like, I've been trying to tell you that. But I'm playing that when I've been playing, and I played my, my stream last week was a wild stream where I started at rank 12 and just played Odd Rogue and just hit people in the face for a while. And it, like, it was fun, but pretty much any time I do a wild stream, I know that I'm just like a little bit aimless in Hearthstone at the moment. And so I took some time off. I finished Hollow Knight on the Switch, which is a great game, and I've been playing a couple other things. I did get... I, I've also started my BFA prep in WoW, so... I'm I'm doing a bunch of theory crafting and brewing for Boomsday, but really I I feel like many people feel right now is just waiting for the next thing to start. Man, y'all are some wet blankets for ladder this past week. <laughs> I mean, I still, finished, no, I still finished I still finished top one one thousand without really playing a whole lot. I played a little bit and still maintain. I was still playing on ladder and maintaining that, but yeah, you know, just mostly doing quests and stuff though. Just like kind oh, of yeah. passively doing it, playing playing even pa- or even shaman and still maintaining top one thousand. You know, casual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But- now is a good time to make sure that whatever your relationship is with the game that you that you give it time to grow and flourish if it needs that or that you keep watering it if it's already in a good place um there have been a lot of people i've talked to that are getting frustrated with the meta or just aren't sure what to do and other people that really really like it and you know what if you're enjoying it and it's what you want to invest your time in that's great i think for me last season i made my first ever attempt at a high legend push and it basically i think it was the least pleasant thing i've done in hearthstone in a long time so I definitely just stayed as far away from that as I could this season once I hit Standard Legend and really just allowed myself to find the fun in the game, learn something new, and then not feel too bad if I spent some gaming energy elsewhere for now because I know next Tuesday we're, I have two things planned for next Tuesday. We're going to build my girlfriend's new computer, and then we're going to play a lot of Hearthstone. Yeah, and that's just kind of how different people approach the game differently, how they find fun. Some people find fun just trying to be the absolute best player they could be or, like, be better than everybody else and, like, push for, like, rank one. Some people just like playing wacky decks. Some people just like playing a specific class. It's just it's just all about finding fun where you're at. And I think that's what, what Hat said is really important. It's definitely really healthy to cultivate a positive relationship with the game before the next expansion comes out. Um, and speaking of that, I've really enjoyed this meta a lot, personally. Uh, so I've I was grinding on all three servers, just not not for a finish at all, because my points don't matter uh, for season two, uh, the prelim tournament. Is it called prelims or is it called something different now? Because I know it used to be called prelims. Is it playoffs? Yeah, I HGT still call it prelims, playoffs. but yeah, it's playoffs. the it's, it's the seasonal it's playoffs, playoffs, right? Yeah, yeah. There's three so, seasonal so, playoffs, and then there's the world championships. Yeah, I'm not even remotely close enough to having enough points to getting into the season two playoffs. So I just didn't worry about a finish at all. So I just tried to get as high up to legend as or as high up as possible and maybe even into legend. Didn't get to do that on EU. Unfortunately, the only deck I have on there is Miracle Rogue, which with the season rewards yesterday that came out, I finally got my second golden prep. So I have a Woo! fully golden Miracle Rogue on EU. Woo! And it feels so good. And unfortunately, for some reason on EU, I think it was something around the neighborhood of 35 to 40% of games I played were against hunters. Spell hunters and mid-range hunters. And I, I don't know why. It's just maybe it's just a really, really awkward anomaly that I'm running into. But yeah, that was that was kind of my experience on EU. I got up to rank one, so I reset at five. So I'm completely fine with that. 
for some reason the light's dimming in my room so hopefully that doesn't cut out but uh yeah reset on five there which is cool uh, i hit legend on na about midway through the season so i just kind of hovered around there and for s- some of you may know that i have a free-to-play account on asia and I built Healzu on there, and I, I spent a little bit of time grinding out dust to build Kelisess. Uh, so that took a while. And I started from rank 25, and uh, I can't say exactly that this was my record, because I think the record that I tracked on my computer was 18 and 3, and I spent a little bit of time off um, on my phone, and I don't have like deck tracker in there or anything, but I believe my record was 21 and 5 from rank 25 and I peaked at rank 18. I'm That's just going to let that so sink in. Nuts. Out of 26 games, I won 21 of them and I only got to rank 18. So I'm doing this free to play thing on Asia and I plan on keeping this account completely free to play so I can go through the new player experience again and go through a free to play experience and like it is I really underestimated how difficult it is to either start an account or start from a low rank again with the new ranking system, because it is just so hard to rank up from the lower ranks. It's such a grind, like even more than before. I think I'd prefer being reset to 16 and having to grind my way back up than starting at 25 and trying to get up there now, because it is, it is really difficult. But uh, yeah, that was my experience on ladder. I kind of gave up at rank 18. I was like, Man, I got like a day left. I'm I'm not going to be able to put in enough games to get to Legend on Asia. So I'm just going to chill, have a reasonable deck. So I'll be laddering with that on Asia, trying to get up as high as I can before Boomsday drops. But we'll we'll see how uh, high I get. I'll have an update on that next week on the podcast. And I'm planning on uh, kind of firing up my blog again and like writing about my experience as a free-to-play player on asia but yeah that that's that's what my ladder was at the end of the the end of the month so not gonna ramble too much longer about that so you should probably go ahead and get to the news because i can't control myself it's i'm i'm really glad we asked the listeners and we got another letter about ladder experience we'll read that on our discord discussions bonus episode which we have tentatively planned for uh for two weeks or uh, i guess it's a week from monday um but i think that we were talking about this a bit in the pre-show we had no idea just how much of a grind that entering the ladder has become. This has to be a major exit point, right? Like just a thing that keeps people from wanting to play more. Yeah, like I've I've played Hearthstone since 2015, pretty competitively at points, but very very religiously at at the very least. I've I've played Hearthstone for a very long time, and even for me, it was an exit point on Asia because I just gave up. I had an 80% win rate, or at, at least I'm fairly positive that this this was my record. Uh, if if not, it's like one win, one loss off or something like that. But it's around an 80% win rate, and I just gave up because it was too much. And d- like that's that's me talking. Like I live and breathe Hearthstone. Like do a podcast, write articles about it. Like I love Hearthstone, and I just I just checked out. I said nope, it's not worth it. It's just not worth doing this. So I can imagine this being a really, really big exit point for people either coming back to the game or just getting into ladder. But I, I think this will may become a big enough issue just in the community in general that Blizzard may address it. But uh, I, I personally, I hope they do at some point because it it kind of stinks. But I, I don't want the negativity of that to kind of linger over the show because this show is going to be awesome because we have so much cool boomsday stuff to talk about all the cards got released and i'm so excited to talk about them same all right news time All right, so this week in the news, we're actually going to be changing up a little bit how we're going to be doing the news section. So in the past, we've kind of compiled all the news items and just gone over everyone individually. And after discussing a little bit, and as you have all heard us constantly talk about the length of our episodes kind of keep getting longer and longer. And really, this is... uh, 
podcast about making the competitive side of the game more accessible to our listeners, not about us rambling on about small news sections and just reading essentially what you can all just go to the main website and read for the most part. So we're going to change up how we're doing this a little bit. It's going to be just news highlights, things that we really want to discuss on the show, things that are relevant to your interests. So you're still going to get uh, our commentary on some of the bigger news items, but maybe some of the smaller stuff won't be there as it has been in the past. So for the first news item, the biggest uh, highlight, I think, for the week was actually the stream that happened today. It was the Boomsday Project final card reveal live stream. This was hosted by Mike Dene and Day9. It was actually broadcast on the Blizzard Twitch channel. So if you wanted to go back and watch it and can't find it on the Play Hearthstone channel, make sure you go over to the Blizzard's official uh, Twitch channel. Uh, I watched it while I took a little break at work so that I could watch this today. And I have always been a big fan of Day9. I have not been a huge fan of when he himself is streaming Hearthstone just by himself. And, but it, overall, I just love the guy. He's extremely entertaining. I love that he can I hopefully bring in some people who maybe not as hardcore Hearthstone players in to, to watch this reveal stream. And uh, this one just went a little differently than usual. I, I was We were talking before the show about it, and Hat made a really good point that Mike Dene just didn't feel like he brought out the same energy that the Boomsday is kind of letting off it, it seems like boomsday should be this really exciting thing and uh it it didn't fit as well and i didn't really want to bring up the whole ben bro not being there thing because that i i feel like that brought gets brought up too much but uh, overall just i i didn't get the same feeling that i usually get when when i watch these reveal episodes uh hat since, since i kind of already talked to you about this what, what what's your take on on the live stream i assume you were able to watch it so I didn't get to see the whole thing. I was at work. I watched a good bit of it while I was eating dinner today. And Mike Danaeus, he's been a card gamer for a long, long time. Super smart guy. I really enjoyed when he was at BlizzCon. He was on the panel. They were talking about the arena-specific cards. And they went into the reasoning as to what they were trying to do. And you could tell he kind of had this analytical and passionate approach to the game even though his personality is definitely more of definitely more analytical. It's definitely a lot of we thought about this and we think this would be really cool and and this happens and this happens. He could kind of see the ripples in the pond and was good at explaining it, very articulate. But a reveal stream is marketing. It's a marketing event. And he does not come across like a marketer. So I respect what he does for the game. A researcher is not your PR person. And I think that he is excellent to have on the design team but I don't think he's the person I would have put to for the last reveal stream. If you put him with Kibler for the first stream, right? And Kibler, who has the game design background, would probably be able to play off of what Danaeus does. Would probably be able to play off of, we're both people that have made card games. We know what we think makes them work. This is what I've done in the past. This is what you've done in the past. This is what we've seen. These are the mistakes we want to avoid making. I think you could make it kind of fascinating. And then if you if you put Waylon and Day Nine, I think that'd be a really fun combination. But instead, Day Nine has a lot of charisma and personality. But I really enjoyed when him and Brode got each other carried away, and that never really felt like it happened here. It felt like Day Nine's job was to amp the room up, and then and then Mike was the one to bring it back to Earth. And I don't want to come back to Earth. I want to go to Area Fifty Two. I want to go to the Boomsday. So I don't know. Yeah, it feels like. It feels like that's the point of these decks is, uh, and also Chalky built the decks. I, I don't know how I necessarily felt about how the decks were built. Maybe there wasn't a much better way to to build them to be really wacky. But I feel like on these deck reveal videos where they're revealing all the decks you can make with this, they have the Blizzard team has these ideas of these crazy you know, combos and just weird stuff and all of these cards that generally don't see play in high competitive play, they have them all in these decks so they can do these funky things. But it felt like the decks that Chalky made were 
almost semi competitive viable, but had <laughs> had some of the other cards that may or may not end up end up making it in the decks. I, I don't know if you got that same feel. What were you able to catch the the stream, Appa? No, uh, I was working like all day today, and then I got home and had to do some other stuff. So I I really didn't get a chance to catch this so i can't really comment on them unfortunately i just looked at the spoiler list after all the cards were revealed that's my kind of introduction to all the all the new cards wait a minute yeah so why didn't they have chalky with day nine he was playing He was playing hearthstone he's a streamer new developer it, the that people know on both sides of the coin and his involvement is supposed to make us excited because it's a person that knew how to exploit Hearthstone that's now keeping other people from doing that. And and he's a he's a memer streamer. Why is he not the person next to day nine? Yeah, that would have that would have been so great. Also because if Chalky built the decks then he knows kind of what they're supposed to do and he can lead day nine in the direction of getting blown getting out the deck. <laughs> Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> but either way, I, I still think it was a is a good reveal stream. Got to see a bunch of new cards before the whole list got revealed. So still worth checking out. The next stream is actually one that's coming up this weekend. It's going to be a experience the pre-release with the Twitch community. This one's going to be hosted by Cora, Frodan, and Ali Straza, which Whoa. is a... Yeah, it's a pretty cool casting bunch. I saw Ali Straza's video. I usually mention hers because they're really good. I really liked it. Her reveal video this season. Uh, but this one's going to be broadcast on the Play Hearthstone Twitch channel. Um, I'm going to be physically at one of these pre-releases, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to catch it. I believe it's at 10 a.m. Pacific time. But maybe, Appa, do you think you might be able to catch this? Because I remember last week you you were saying you probably aren't going to be able to make it out to a pre-release so i don't know if you're working but maybe you could catch some of the pre-release uh pre-release stream here what what date was this again sorry saturday was... it's gonna be saturday at saturday. 10 there it sounds cora talked about it a little bit on well met this week uh she was on that podcast talking about uh that she's gonna be on the stream and they're gonna have some pro players playing some some decks against each other with some of the new cards and they they might be participating later in the day as well. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'll be able to catch this live, but I'll definitely want to check it out because I'm working for like the next six days or something, like during the middle of the day for like all the days. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll definitely want to check at least the vod out if nothing else. But I probably won't won't be able to catch it live, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and Hat, you're likely going to be going to that pre-release in New York, I hope? I hope so. Well, I, it, if I do go, it will be the one in New York. I don't have <laughs> options outside of that. There are seven in the country, and I work ten blocks from exactly one of those seven. So if I did go to one, it would be that one. Um, it is right before my shift at work, and there is there's a fee to there's a fee to get in the door. So I got it's either five dollars to watch and have pizza, or twenty dollars to play and have pizza. And so I gotta like obviously pizza's great, but I gotta just make sure that I uh, I'm using the time wisely. There, it probably is worth it to go there, and I I'm sure I'll see some people I know. But I didn't realize it wasn't like a, I guess that the tournament site has to has to finance that somehow. But I I didn't put two and two together and realized that I should probably pay for that. Fair enough. I knew I should pay for the uh, pizza though. There's no such thing as free pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Uh, so the next line item we have here was probably the best reveal video we've ever seen. It was for the card Luna's Pocket Galaxy, and it was directed by a guy named Amazing LP, who was given the the reveal by NetEase and and Play Hearthstone. Uh, and I, I don't even I don't even know how I could describe this and give it justice but it was live action hearthstone it, i i i don't even know I, Appa, I, you watched the video right before uh right before the cast what, what was your impression of, of this video i think it was yeah so i think i think any way we try and describe the video is going to do a disservice so i think if you're listening to this, if you're not like driving a car and you're listening to this like while you're laying down or something, pause the podcast, 
either go to our show notes or go to YouTube and go to Luna's Pocket Galaxy reveal video because it is awesome. And then after you're done watching that, come back here. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, you're back. So that was awesome, right? <laughs> so that, that video was so cool. My favorite part was when uh, she played Luna's Pocket Galaxy and then the Anduin just looked and he just went, wow, wow, wow. And then scratched his head and then it said plus two health. And then the music kicked in, and then I started dying with laughter. This was my favorite card reveal, I think, that I've ever seen. It was actually, like, surprisingly really well-directed for, like, just a Hearthstone card reveal. And, I don't know, I loved everything about it. At, at, like, the second I got into it, I was like, what is this? And then they started going, and I was like, oh, okay, this is actually really cool, awesome. Continue. And then it just got better the longer the video went on. Yeah, so like Kappa said, watch this video. It's insanely good. Do you have any comments, Hat? It's a live action meme compilation is something I never knew I needed it until now. Yeah, it, it was so good. All right, so the next one, I know the Hat's going to want to talk about this. This is an article, Developer Insights 12.0 Arena Update with Chris Zihut. Zero, zero, I'm sorry if I butchered that. Uh, basically, they're doing a few changes to Arena. They were saying that the bonus for class cards and spells that you get in your buckets was appearing too high, so they're going to reduce it down a little bit. Uh, class cards are going to go from 100% bonus appearance rate to a 50%, and spells and weapons are going to go from 75% down to 50% bonus. They're also going to be lowering the appearance rate of rares and epics outside of picks 1, 10, 20, and 30, which will always be rares or better. Uh, rares are going to go down to an 11% chance outside of that, and epics down to a 5% chance uh, outside of that. And then they gave us some actual data of 100,000 uh, test drafts and I know this is what Hat wants to talk about because this is just an immense amount of data about appearance rate and card buckets. Oh, data. So much data. So, there's a bunch of things to talk about here. First, transparency. This is not your average transparency. This is, here's how all the math that you could ever possibly want works out in this format that is even more variance dependent than others because it, it depends, your deck's construction depends on variance and, and statistics. And how you make informed decisions about how to build that deck depends on the likelihood of something else happening. Really, really important to this format. And the dev said, you know what? Okay. You want to know which buckets cards are in? We're going to show you every single thing. Every single card, which buckets it's in. And every card is in two buckets because there's now half buckets. And for those that, that are asking why I'm talking about buckets so much, so the way Arena works now, they basically sort cards into, they call them buckets. They're like tiers, categories based on power level. And there's a weighted random possibility of getting any number of groups of cards, any tier or bucket is what they call it, based on the power level of the cards that are in the bucket. So you're not going to get all 1s, and you're not going to get all 12s. You're not going to get all great cards or all terrible cards. It's going to try and vary which bucket you're pulling from. So it wants to make sure that you get cards of distributed power level, some better than others, some worse than others, but an interesting decision based on cards of similar power level every time. And there was a lot of positive feedback to that idea of making sure you group by power level and not by rarity, because it used to be you opened an epic and you said, which weird, terrible card am I putting in my deck now? Or it's a UI and you won. So now what they do is they say, this is the bucket that every single card is in. And to show you how these new bonuses work, we're going to run a simulation of 100,000 arena drafts and show you the results of where cards are seen how frequently on average. Amazing that they're giving us that much information using their back of house data. They're not giving us the actual percentages, the actual weights, but they're showing this is what's likely going to happen over this amount of time. And they're explaining how they do it. And they're showing their logic behind it. And they're giving us the raw data to play with, which is the best part. 
Well, the second best part, because the best part is they rebalanced a bunch of cards and said we balance cards based on how often they're picked, except for mind control tech. It's not picked that often, but whenever it's played and the effect goes off, everyone is sad, so we just made it less frequently occurring anyway. There's not a single thing about this article I didn't like. It's really well done by Blizzard. Doesn't transparency from a company just make you feel warm and fuzzy inside and establish trust with the consumer and the company between that relationship? Isn't this just, like, fantastic? Uh, It's not a rhetorical question. That's That sounded extremely (laughs) rhetorical. It, yes, yeah, you're, it, it you're really, okay. Yes. There, there we go. But, and yes. this is why I've been a proponent for so long about just having transparency about what's going on the scenes behind, uh, behind the scenes in Hearthstone. I've I've seen some counter arguments to like, if if you give transparency and then you do something different, then people are upset. But like, when you're just transparent like this, it just establishes trust in your player base, and it just lets lets them see what you're doing and understand what's going on and nobody's left in the dark, and it's just wonderful. And the transparency that we've been seeing from them recently is absolutely fantastic. And I think Hearthstone, it, like, behind the scenes, in terms of the development team and communication, is in one of the best spots it's ever been since I started playing. And I, I am... I have, like, so, so much, like, hope for the game... And I, I think it's just in such a good place right now. And I, I can't even like, I can't really gush anymore about how great this transparency is. Let's say, let's save some gushing for some of these cards we're about to talk about later in the episode and move on to the last news item here, which was a article in Forbes. This was essentially an interview with Heather Newman, Peter Whalen, about a bunch of cards uh, out of the Boomsday project, including some that didn't end up making the cut, cards that were not actually uh, created. Uh, Some of them seem kind of broken, like the Scrap Reaver, which was a Warlock Legendary 6-6 that swaps the attack and cost of all minions in your hand, which is a super weird effect. But then they realized that uh, that effect with a summoning portal is super broken because you really don't want zero mana for four summoning portals going around and doing really broken things. Oof. Uh, Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Or or uh, four mana six four gadgets and auctioneers. Yeah, that's that's I'd, also very I'd, good. I accept. <laughs> yeah, and three mana six six or six seven Glindas that make zero mana and then you have zero mana summoning portals yeah it's oh, man. it gets gross three mana um, five four vial spines i'm done i'm done <laughs> so either way we're uh that's uh that's a really long uh article with a bunch of awesome questions and back and forths in there for you to all check out and that's all i had for the highlights for this week in the news uh let's move on to tournaments it's the grand tournament. Tournaments. Okay. So this was actually a super heavy tournament week as a way to send off the Witchwood meta. And I think if we look back at it, post-nerf, the Witchwood meta has been one of the most interesting and difficult to predict that we've seen ever. Actually, ever, right? Because it's changing every single week. And this week, we're going to talk about a lot of trends that have shifted once again. And the HCT Tokyo is the first place that we're going to touch on. Hanaya took first place there over Alan 870706. I'll just call him Alan from now on. Hunter Race, you may have heard that name before. Top forward along with Machamp. And Machamp, if you don't know who he is, he's actually a famed, uh, I believe, Japanese deck builder who originated mid-range murloc uh control paladin among other things that's the deck that i know him for and he that that's a really loaded top four we've got rivius high three plev b and kama Ritai in the top eight there is also seat story cup a 32 person invite only tournament it's last year of standing like our listener league which is accepting signups right now by the way go check it out and and board control won that tournament over casey with Orange and Kalento, third and fourth, as you can tell, also a star-studded top four. Stan Sifka, Gara, Meliador, and Impact were in the top eight. 
and we had week two of HGG. Now, HGG, I want to talk about a bit. We're not going to go too in-depth on that because it's very difficult to assess the meta, especially when the format is so strange. So as a reminder, the format here is both teams have nine decklists pre-built from each of the classes, and they go into a simultaneous pick-and-ban process where they ban a deck of their opponents, pick two of their own they're going to keep, ban two of their opponents, pick two, and they go back and forth till there are five decks left to play. Five classes, open deck lists. The opponent knows what's going to happen. And then the teams secretly determine the order in which they're going to play the decks. And that is the order that they play no matter what wins or loses. There are four players in a team. Each player has to play once, and each player gets a different deck. So if you have five decks, let's say... Pick five decks here. Let's say you have Egg Hunter, Token Druid, Odd Rogue, Heal Zoo, and, and Shutter Rock Shaman. You take those five decks and you determine the order they're going to get played in, and each one gets played exactly once against the secret order of your opponents. So if you lead with Odd Rogue and you face down a Druid, you're probably really, really happy. If you lead with Odd Rogue and you face down Odd Paladin, you're probably pretty sad. And you don't get to determine which deck you play against. It is based entirely on secret decisions with no outside information, also known as random. You might have a little bit of education, a guess, some information about what your opponent's going to play, but there's not really any incentive to do anything that's not random. So you've got two, you've got two different teams with five-on-five five random 1v1s. The format has some flaws, and there's been a lot of detractors of it. It makes for fun, punchy viewing experiences for the watchers, and it makes a lot of variety in the decks, I suppose, but it doesn't make the tournament experience all that great for the competitors. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. When you watch the format, if you're not sure what's going on, every single match you will see a different deck from both sides. And so you'll see a lot of different decks being played, but you won't really know which matchups are going to get played. And if it's a really unfavored matchup, that's just how it is. So when in our 2-0, we've got the teams that are that are way ahead right now. I'm going to do the 2-0s and, and the 0-2s, because we've got a big list of 1-1s. and But the 2-0s that are undefeated so far, Czech Republic, Brazil, Italy, New Zealand, Poland, Spain, Taiwan, Belarus, Romania, Singapore, Ukraine, and China. And then the 0-2s, which are one match away from getting eliminated. Australia, Austria, Croatia, Argentina, the United States, Hungary, Japan, Mexico, the Philippines, Israel, Malaysia, and Turkey. If you get three losses, you are mathematically eliminated from advancing. So those teams have to win out four more matches to prevent themselves from going home. It's, uh... That is a stacked O2. Right? The teams in the O2 are... There's a, there's a lot of really good teams there. And of course, the 2-0 and bracket, they've got some really, really great players. I think I'm really keeping a close eye on the Spanish team. I think they're really set up well this year and they've been playing well. But there's it's it's a stacked 0-2 bracket as well. And I think it's it's tough to look at the format of the tournament and say it really lends itself to super skilled determination of who's going to advance. So it is what it is. It's fun to watch. I definitely would recommend watching it. It's great that it's this ongoing series. But we can't really analyze the meta there, so we're not going to. Just be aware when you watch that the format is pretty much different from anything else we've ever seen. As far as the tournament meta, so the Tokyo meta, we've got the top 16. The seat story we'll go into after. Remember, these are two different formats. One is Conquest, where you stop playing a deck when you win with it. And one is Last Year of Standing, when you stop playing a deck when you lose with it. Very, very different format, so you'll notice different decks in both. But still, some of the trends are starting to line up between the two as the meta stabilizes on its way out. Tokyo, the top 16... We've seen a big shift from the last tournament where anti-control was the way to go, where Tare was kind of ahead of the field. Now we've got a lot of anti-control and then some anti-anti-control. The most popular druid out of the 15 that were played, there were six token druids. It was the most popular druid. Mali was number four, was number two with four of them. There were three taunt druids and two spiteful druids. It's a very different metagame than what we were expecting. As far as the Warlocks go, Cube Warlock was the most popular Warlock. And even and Zoo were tied. There were six cubes, four evens, four Zoos. And then the number three broad class was Hunter. Seven players out of the 11 in top 16 had Egg Hunter. And AHQ Shaxi 
did not play Katharina in his hunter. It was full eggs and death rattles. No Katharina, no King Crush. So Egg Hunter has really exploded onto the scene in the past couple weeks and is doing really, really well and is very well represented along with two mid-range hunters, a secret hunter, and a Baku face hunter. I don't think any of us expected this meta to shift this way, but Oppa said he was seeing a lot of hunters on Asia. That translated to HCT Tokyo. It was the third most broad class, and it was quite successful. As far as rogues, there were 10 of them in the top top 16. Four miracles, four odds, two quests. Two quest rogues, that's right. There were six shaman decks, all Shutterwalk. bonkers. Right? What? <laughs> it's such a weird meta, and it continues to evolve every single week. Got six shaman, all walk, four paladin, all odd, two priest, one quest, one mind blast, two mage, one aggro, and one big. It's a very anti-control tournament. Alan got to the final. He's the finalist with spiteful druid, baku hunter, tempo mage, and miracle rogue. He did not want to lose to control. He did not care about facing aggro. He did not want to lose to control. And he didn't, but the lineup he lost to in the finals from Hinaya was token druid, mid-range hunter, odd rogue, and heal zoo. By the way... If you're looking at all these these druid cards that everyone's talking about for next expansion, and you want to spend four mana, draw a seven drop, an eight drop, a nine drop, and a ten drop, be aware that these eight decks right here are the fun police, and they're coming for you with the sirens on. So be aware of that. Hunter Ace's top four. We've got similar to his HCT Italy lineup. He had the same decks he did before: Odd Rogue, Odd Paladin, and uh, and Token Druid. And then instead of Big Spell Mage, he played Heal Zoo. And Machamp did top four with Egg Hunter, Quest Rogue, Shutterwalk, and Cube Lock, also very much anti-control. So it's a really big shift from what we've seen before. Now, we look over at the last year's standing tournament at Seat Story. Very different story. There were 32 Druids out of 32 players, 13 Maligos, by far the most popular, 8 Token Druids, 6 Big Druids, 4 Taunt Druids, and 1 Midrange. For Warlocks, the second most popular class, there were 30 of them. 14 even Warlocks, by far the most popular. 9 heal zoos, 6 cubes, and 1 demon zoo. That's right, there were the same number of cube blocks in the entire tournament seat story as there were in the top 16 of Tokyo. Very strange to see between the two formats and two tournaments happening at the same time. Hunters, there were 25 of them. 22 were egg. 22 out of 25. 1 midrange, 1 odd, and 1 secret young dragonhawk, tundra rhino, dire frenzy hunter. Never change, Jackie Chan. Just you keep being you. It was called Hawk Hunter on the breakout I saw. And I was like, what is a Hawk Hunter? And I clicked. I was like, oh, of course. It takes a young dragon hawk. It buffs it with Dire Friends. You draw it with Tolvir Warden. And then you play it with Tundra Rhinos. And you hit your opponent in the face. What else could it be? <sighs> Anyone that says this format is stale is not looking in the right places. Anyways, there were 23 Shaman decks in that tournament. You skipped over mid-range Druid? What? What? Oh, yeah. Oh, the mid-range druid. That's right. I forgot about the mid-range druid. That wasn't interesting enough, Boticus. No, this is... <laughs> uh, apparently Cr- not. Crane333 was playing mid-range druid, which is just double savage roar, double branching paths, and then minions that do good stuff at all points of the game and then kill you in the face. Mm. Oh, you mean burst druid, Appa's favorite deck. <laughs> uh, it's, but, like, it plays Cairn, <laughs> right? It plays druid of the claw. This is mid-range druid in that you just play kind of good cards... And then you have a bunch of cards that kill your opponent out of nowhere because you're druid. It's Look, not you, you haven't been keeping up with the ins and outs of uh, the the burst druid tech every week. Cairn's the new hotness, man. I, okay, there is no deck that can be described as burst that has Cairn Bloodhoof in it. Those are mutually exclusive. If it's not a rule before, it's a rule right now. No burst decks can have Cairn. That, that could be a burst deck. One. And two, that it could contain Mukla until like three weeks ago. So there are no rules regarding Burst Druid. <laughs> and it's... I've killed Bodicus. Bodicus is done. I just... <laughs> I don't know. I uh, Okay. <laughs> How you guys doing? Are, we, are Is this... This is the new and streamlined coin this is, concede? This is sufficiently derailed. It's, Bodicus is literally crying. Actually Burst in Druid tears. is... So I understand what they were going for with that, but it is my favorite meme of all time. <laughs> Our stone is just burst <laughs> with some mucklas in there. Just just get just rumbling. Just oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's just getting in there with savage roars. I mean it's that's a that's a five five that comes out of your four mana spell. Oh, yeah. okay. That's, and so back, I've got the <laughs> he labeled he labeled the list real taunt, by the way. 
because it has double strong shell scavenger in it. But that's just another minion buffer. That's all that is. That's more burst. That's add that. It sure is, buddy. It sure is. I have to have a sound bite somewhere here for this, but I just don't know how to explain the feelings that I have right now. Here, this is for you, Bodicus. Dead Tom's dead! <laughs> but, but Dead Tom's always been dead. That's why he's called Dead Tom. Oh. It's the only thing that I had that was even close. Anyways, moving on. So, we had 21 rogues, 9 were odd, 8 were miracle, 4 were quest. 10 paladins, all odd. And by the way, if you want to know the class right now that I think is the weakest, it might be paladin. Because across two tournaments, no one could figure out a second paladin archetype to bring. There were eight priests, seven mind blast, one combo, six warriors, four were quest, one was fatigue, one was odd, five mages, three big, one murloc, and one tempo. So the winning deck, board control played, was with big druid, egg hunter, miracle rogue, shutterwalk, and even warlock. And I should mention, this was a uh, best of seven, not best of five. So you will see five decks from each player, not four. And then Casey came in second with Mally Druid, Mind Blast Priest, of course, Miracle Rogue, which he's known for, Shutterwalk, and Cube Warlock. How did you get to watch either of these tournaments? I was periodically I was periodically watching Seat Story in and out. I never read a long section where I was able to really focus on it, but that, that's just a really fun tournament to watch, uh, especially when you get the right casters in there. Um I couldn't tell you anything specific that I saw, but overall, that's just a really fun tournament. Yeah, the the way they have the rotating, every player will cast at least one match. So the way they have people rotating in is a lot of fun. Uh, it's just the vibe of that tournament is very much relaxed. And again, like I said, Secret, Young Dragonhawk, Tundra Rhino, Dire Frenzy, Jackie Chan, Hunter. And if you're looking for something to do for the next week while Witchwood drops, uh, if you just go... I bet if you went to Hearthpone and just said, went to the deck selector of cards included and picked Young Dragonhawk and Dire Frenzy, it'll probably be the first result. So you can just go do that. That's, you can find the deck list, but that's probably faster. So in terms of games to watch, there were, there were some fun games to watch this week. And there's one series in particular that I think if you only watch one that you go out of your way for, and that is the finals of HCT Tokyo. It was... Hinaya versus Alan, and the games in particular I'm going to talk about are games four and five, but Alan, if you remember, had a very hard-targeted anti-control lineup and was against a, against a bunch of minion decks, still brought it to game five, and it was really impressive to watch him play, and the pair of games that we're going to talk about here really, really need to go together, because game four, Alan found himself with Tempo Mage facing down Heal Zoo. Now, Heal Zoo, if you tap too much, yes, you can get low and get burned out, but typically, Zoo takes the board faster and stays in control, except for, you know, maybe the Tempo Mage Nut Drop. Now, he did top deck a Mana Worm on turn one. He did top deck Archaeologist on turn two. His opening hand had Kirintor Mage, and he did have an Explosive Runes on three. And Hinaya had a bit of an awkward hand. But there's still a lot of interesting decisions that came up here because. Hinaya had way more minions, was able to control the board despite taking some face damage. Still, on turn 4, he had a 4-4 four, four life drinker because he had a turn 2 Kaliseth. And was able to go turn 2, Kaliseth, coin, heal my own face, happy ghoul. Still fine, right? Still a decent opening. But Alan had excellent face discipline, made sure that all of his attacks went to the face. He made sure that Hinaya had to trade. He maximized his arcane missiles output. When he could have taken the mirror image off of Primordial Glyph, he took a Flame Geyser instead, played the Arcane Missiles to ping down his opponent's minion, and use the Flame Geyser to clear it, rather than playing the mirror entity to guarantee more face damage. He got the 1-2, and that was actually pretty relevant later in the game. And on turn 8, right when the game was about to split away, the Alaneth top deck was perfect. And there's an interesting moment at the end of the game here, too, that caused a mild amount of controversy. Alan had lethal on the last turn of the game with a fireball in hand on the left from Alaneth. And he waited and spun his wheels. He primordial glyphed for another glyph for a deck of wonders. He played the deck of wonders. He played a sorcerer's apprentice. He roped and then he fireballed his opponent. Going into the literal last game of the tournament, going into game five, where he knew he was unfavored. 
because what he had left was Spiteful Druid, and his opponent would have had two. Man, you don't really want to be playing that matchup. So Alan pushed to get a psychological advantage. He had said in an interview with Dr. J earlier, who was actually praising uh, pushing the psychological advantage, Alan said he's the kind of player that would rope Keliseth on two because he's looking for those tiny edges. Now, there's been some discussion about this online, including in our own Discord, and in, on the one hand, a caster encouraging BM as part of the game can feel a little not great because it kind of detracts from the experience in the game, but it adds something out of the game of a psychological aspect. And, you know, there's some entertainment value there for some people. Not everybody likes BM, but as a spectator, it adds some nuance, it adds some story. And I think if you look back a couple weeks ago when we talk about Quachi, there was so much entertaining memory going on in that conversation after that match was over that looking back at it, I wouldn't have acted the way that Quachi acted in his game. But we talked about it multiple weeks in a row. And it's created some energy around the game. And we're talking about this right now. And Alan might have had psychological advantage going into game five. Just because he made his opponent angry and emotion leads to worse Hearthstone play. What do you guys think before I go into game five? All right, Botic has pointed to me. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, it's like there's no like guidelines or anything against BM, and BM's extremely subjective. Um, personally, I wouldn't, um, if I had lethal, I wouldn't rope in a tournament. Uh, I'll, I'll only do that on ladder if like my opponent's clearly BMing me with like emotes or something and I freaking to squelch. But I mean, like in a tournament, I'm I'm the kind of person who tries to be very like uh, cordial and very uh, polite, and I'm I'm a pretty quiet person in a tournament. I just like try and sit down and play my game like as tight as possible. And, like I show a lot of respect to my opponents. But I mean, there there is that element of getting a psychological edge. Like there there are some things that I do in tournaments or just in play in general that. Um, some people may construe as BM, uh, what, when I do it, like if, for instance, in a tournament, I don't need to, but I rope like almost every turn in the early turns of the game. And for me, it helps a lot because I struggle really, really bad with anxiety and it helps me just like calm down and not play too fast and kind of get a sense of how a game's going to play out with the hand that I have. And so that helps me, but other people may see that and they're like, why are you roping? You have a, you clearly have no play or like you clearly have a turn one play, just play it. Whereas me roping, it, it just, it's, it's a benefit to me. It's not like something I'm trying to do to get an edge on my opponent, but I mean, that, that's, that is a side effect of it that I actually haven't really thought about until like just now, but there is something that I do when I play, which is if I've set up like a lethal around a specific card or something and like i draw another card that kills my opponent i'll play the card that i top decked and again that's not for me that's not meant to be bm that's not to, meant to be rude to my opponent but it's meant to kind of imply in a subtle way like maybe i didn't have the answer and i drew into it even if even if i like set up the game to where i had the answer in my hand already I think that playing something off the top, if you're playing against somebody who can be an emotional player or like they've been having a bad run in a tournament or something, that that's an edge that you get. And I think I think that's important to discuss. Um, I I don't I don't really vibe with the idea of like encouraging BM like on a broadcast, but I mean like that's just I think that's nitpicking. I guess I don't know. Like it, there there's something to be said for entertainment value for spectators. And I, I I will say that getting like having that happen against you feels horrendous. So I can understand why Alan like did that and why he says that he does those kind of things to get a psychological edge. And I mean, it's completely within his rights as a player. So, I mean, power to him, I guess. Like, I, I think it kind of sucks to rope somebody and I wouldn't do that. But I mean, I'm the kind of person who ropes the first four turns just to chill out and figure out how a game's going to go or I play something off the top to get an edge on my opponent. So like, who am I to talk, you know, but that, that that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. I think there's, 
value to like both sides of that discussion. Um, and I don't really know where I, where I stand on it. I think I'm like pretty much about as on the fence as you can be about it. Yeah. We talk a lot, or I feel like we've talked a lot on this podcast about optics. And while I understand what Alan did and don't, uh, and I think it's okay that he that he did what he did. The idea of having a broadcaster um, kind of condone condone that feels really weird. It doesn't feel doesn't feel super good to me. Um, I I, th- I think a good way to phrase it. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think a good way to phrase it is like it doesn't feel like super professional. If that makes sense. Yeah, and. The thing with uh, Dr. J is that he's he's a pro player, so he can he can really understand the idea of getting as many small edges as possible. But that's I feel like that's more of a opinion of a pro player more so than a caster. And they're two different. They're two very different um, points of view to kind of come from. I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense, but I, I kind of feel like encouraging that kind of stuff is not something you really want to do as a broadcaster, but it maybe just publicly. I, I, I guess I don't have a problem with them allowing for that kind of BM and allowing there to be heels in in Hearthstone, but I don't know that I'd necessarily like the broadcasters to be condoning it to the public, I guess. I, I I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but um, that's just yeah. kind of how I feel. Yeah, I, th- I think it, I think when, what you're saying makes sense, and it's like a really hard thing to get your head around and like really describe how you feel about it because there's like so many different like kind of angles with that you can approach it, and I think it's a, a really nuanced discussion that you can have. And honestly, I'd encourage anybody who's listening right now who either saw it or has an opinion to either uh, jump in our discord or send us an email or something and like talk about how you saw it. Cause we, we, we come from the perspective of like, kind of like more competitive players. Like we play like a lot and like more than we broadcast or like watch stuff or anything. So like, I think we're approaching this more as like competitors. So we have like that kind of, uh, mindset around it so like write in and like tell us like what you thought about it like um how how, how you think uh i don't know did did you enjoy it would you like to see more of it like uh condoning it on a broadcast like wh- whatever like we we love hearing your thoughts on these kinds of things and so it's, it's such a nuanced discussion i think it's important to get as many different perspectives as possible so i think writing in and hearing from listeners would be fantastic on this Strongly agree, and we'll leave it there for now because we're hoping on the first episode of Discord Discussions in a week and a half that we'll be able to talk about this. And you know, it would be an amazing story if we say Hanaya was so rattled going into Game 5 that Alan was able to ride that psychological advantage in the bad matchup and punish his opponent for, not punish, get rewarded for his psychological advantage. But nope, Hanaya went, turn 1 Flame Imp, turn 2 Double Light Warden, Face to Crypt Lord, bump in, Fungal Enchanter, attack for seven, Happy Ghoul, turn three, go. Alan pursed his lips, nodded his head, played a Serenite Chain Gang, got blown up by Fungal Mancer, and got killed on turn five. So, uh, I'm not going to say it was because Alan BM'd, I'm going to say Karma is, is a thing. Karma is a witchwood. How about that? So Karma is a witchwood. Witch so it was, and I will say to Alan's credit, he played right into the camera. He he leaned his head back. He nodded. He clapped when he lost. Shook his opponent's head with a big smile, like it's or shook his opponent's hand with a big smile. It was uh, it was really entertaining. Really enjoyed watching it, and ultimately. I think I agree with Bodicus in that endorsing the behavior is different from recognizing the behavior, and the tacit endorsement from a caster will just encourage other people to do it, even though they may not know the reasons behind it. I think speaking to the reasons rather than speaking to the the behavior makes a lot more sense. But either way, it was fun to watch. Go watch that series. Lots of ups and downs, tight technical play, interesting 
interpersonal interactions, and a complete blowout in Game 5. It was fun. Now, if you want just the technical part, in the Seed Story Cup Final, Boar Control was playing Even Warlock and Casey was playing Cube Warlock. I actually don't know which one is favored here at this skill level because both these players are incredibly skilled. I want to lean towards the Q block a little bit, but I, I think it's pretty close either way. And this game was a Mountain Giant Clown Fiesta, where it was Turn 4 Mountain Giant, followed by Turn 4 Mountain Giant, followed by Stubborn Gastropod Go Face, followed by Faceless Your Giant Trade Into Your Snail, followed by Faceless the Giant again. There were four Mountain Giants that had been played by Turn 6 in this game. They all died. Slow mid-game development. Void Lord comes out, but Casey never got his Doom Guards at the Q block. And Boar Control, as a very, very skilled player, just put out just enough pressure to say, you need to deal with all these threats, but when you do, I got more. Just enough. And then when he was at 7 life against a Q block, he was able to still be the aggressor. With smart timing and placement of taunts, and smart control of hooked reavers and his life total, and bouncing down in life, and then bouncing back up with the spell stones he'd been holding all game, gaining 7 twice, pretty good when you're removing stuff. When you're at 7 life against a Q block, it's like you're watching Top Gun, because you're in the danger zone. But it didn't even matter, because Boar Control deserved to win this tournament, and this was the match I always look for matches when I look for games to watch, especially in last year of standing where a player breaks serve, where they when you, you're supposed to go last year of standing, even place decks at the beginning, and then the player that loses queues up their counter queue, and then you queue up your counter queue and you go back and forth for a while. Anytime a player breaks that paradigm in last year of standing, that's a game you want to check out, because it usually means they're winning an unfavored matchup. And from what I can tell, this was an unfavored matchup for board control, but he played it really, really well and won the tournament because of this game. Because he broke serve, threw off his opponent's lineup, and was able to keep Casey from uh, from winning. So, check it out. Very complex. We're not going to go fully into detail about every single play-by-play -play of this game, but it is worth your time, especially for highly technical reading and adaptation to a new situation. And that's the tournament section. And we've got a break because Boomsday, HGG, is taking off a couple weeks. We've got a little bit of time before the next tournament. And that's the first hour of the show down, and we're ready to talk about some new cards. Are y'all ready? Boomsday. Boomsday. No, we're not... <sighs> Okay, had, had wrote in show notes, Appa go. So I think that means the bumper was over because I didn't hear it end. So we're going to get into explanations, which are just a bunch of new cards. And we're not going to go over all of them because that would be a six-hour show because we can't help ourselves. The, the, the Legos? Yes. What? This week we're going over, I, I figured that uh, we should go definitely over all the legendaries, even if we don't have a ton to say about them, because I feel like the legendaries are just really key to understanding kind of the class and what they might be trying to do with some of the other cards. So going over all the legendaries this week, and then we all chose a couple extra cards that are not legendaries that we wanted to go over as well. So we'll start. We're going to go in order from our last episode till does, now. Does Lego stand for legendary? Did I yes. did I miss that memo? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I feel like hats called them Legos for for a while. So Legos are many know. things. They are small toys that enhance your imagination. It is a thing that you do to somebody else's ego. It's a known fact. <laughs> and it is an abbreviation for legendary. Yeah, because hat typed that. He said, these are just the Legos in the show notes. And I froze up. <laughs> it's like, what's a Lego? I don't understand. Someone help. I need an adult. All right, yeah, so these are just the <laughs> legendaries. We're going to get into them. So first up, we got the Boom Ship. It's a nine-mana warrior legendary spell. It says, summon three random minions from your hand. Give them rush. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Yeah, who who knows? Uh, I mean, I, I you could play this in Recruit Warrior, but I 
don't know how good that is because generally I feel like you want to space out your threats. But the one cool thing I was thinking about this is if you uh, dead man dead man's hand two extra groms into your deck and then you get only the groms in your hand, then you can boom ship and whirlwind and deal 30 to your opponent. So that's, that's all I came up with. There's definitely combos here, but I don't think this is like the priest spell where this is what's going to happen when you play this to try and win the game. It's a big effect. A lot of what warrior does, it either defends or attacks, but it can't do both. And this card enables you to do both. Now, it's awkward and clunky, but a lot of this set is awkward and clunky ways to do cool things. And what we were talking about before the show is that this set doesn't print aggro tools. This set prints tools that punish you by by facing aggro decks, even though they're very powerful. So they're building Battlecruiser Hearthstone where you try and do the coolest, biggest thing. But the aggro decks that currently exist, as well as the aggro decks that are not quite good enough to exist, are definitely enhanced by a slower meta. And you saw this at HCT Tokyo. Baku Face Hunter made the finals. Baku Face Hunter is not good enough in a minion-based metagame. It's not good enough in a mid-range metagame. In a control metagame, it probably is. And the more big cards that people print that you want to play in this kind of arms race to the top, it enables more room to go under. So I think Boomsday is intelligently designed and that is giving us all these open-ended tools that require a lot of setup. And it makes aggro better when the cards for aggro are worse if that makes we're, sense we're playing battle cruiser hearthstone oh man you it's, sunk my boom ship the boom ship is literally a battle cruiser it cruises into battle and drops a bunch of minions and to be fair how many times have you dropped something like uh, you can say savannah high main or you drop a lich king and then it gets silenced and you die but if instead you boom ship out a, a Lich King and two other minions that are reasonably sized. You you boom ship out just Lich King and Rotface, just those two. And instead of sitting there and dying to a Vile Spine Slayer or Spellbreaker, you trade into two minions. You get an extra legendary in that case, even though it's just a four six, and you don't die on the swing back if they have the Spellbreaker. Yeah, this this kind of reminds me of Varian Rin from like a couple years ago it was played in a tempo style warrior deck and this this isn't really the the, the same because varian rin refilled whenever you're out of gas but if you're playing like a, a tempo based or a mid-range style warrior deck and you have a reasonable amount of high-end curve toppers or you have a reasonable amount of like let's say five six plus cost minions in your deck, you'll usually end up because you're curving and like developing weapons and stuff. You'll end up with a few minions in your hand uh, at, at turn nine or whenever you're able to play this or when you draw it. And you might be able to just play this out as a one card kind of really, really huge swing turn to either get you back into a game or like solidify a lead. That's kind of how I'm looking at this card. I don't think it's really like I'm not like visualizing any like really busted combos or anything. And I'm I've been seeing a lot of people talk about like Charge Devil Sore and like uh, Grimash and stuff like that. And I think it's cool like Rotface and Grimash. Um, but I think that's that would be the kind of shell that this would really fit into is like a mid range or tempo style warrior deck that has a, a pretty chunky top end, so so that you'll have reasonable targets whenever you hit nine mana. Yes. Bot gave me the head nod of, of approval. Awesome. I, I guess that means we're moving on. So the the next card, <laughs> another head nod. Cool. Next card we're going to talk about is called Crystal Smith Kangor. It is a two mana paladin legendary minion. It is a one two with divine shield and life steal, and it says your healing is doubled. I like this card a lot. Uh, I don't know if it's good enough, but it feels like there are some cards in this set that make control paladin seem more interesting to me and any card that makes me want to play uh lay on hands cuz this card is pretty sweet on turn 10 with lay on hands uh is something i'm interested somewhat interested in you can draw it off of the two mana spell that draws one power 
things, and the two mana one two divine shield lifesteal stat line I feel like is fine. I it it seems like just a somewhat reasonable early game minion. I I'm sure it reminds you guys a little bit of burn bristle. It's kind of yeah. I th I think it kind of occupies somewhat of the same space. They're obviously like very different cards, but I think the archetypes that they go into would probably be close to the same kind of like uh end game you're trying to get to where you're trying to stall and just like really kind of get as much value out of that life steal as possible and i i wouldn't sleep on a one two with divine shield honestly i i know anoyatron has taunt so you have to deal with it but the one two body on anoyatron by itself is just really obnoxious to deal with with the divine shield so i think even removing the taunt and then putting life steal and the other effect on kangor where your healing is doubled might honestly just make it good enough to fit into a, a slower paladin list. It it'll really depend on whether or not paladin gets enough new tools to play a slower game to compete with all of the other battle cruiser decks that are out there right now. But I think this card um, looks better than what it appears on the surface. I think it's going to be better than how it looks on the surface. Is what I'm trying to say. It it looks kind of unassuming. But when you think about the applications in Paladin versus aggro or like even something like Malagos against Malagos Druid, like if, if they start chipping you down with like their tempo plan and then you play like play this on 10 and then lay on hands, you gain 16 life, draw three cards. Like that's pretty dope. So I, I think this card definitely has applications. It'll just be the context, I think, of whether we have a slow uh enough tools for a slow paladin deck because i don't think this is good enough for uh, a minion based deck but I, I could be wrong on that too maybe the one two divine shield is a reasonable enough and sticky enough body to just play in a, a minion based deck but that, that's how i'm looking at this card i mean at a certain point of density it's the in a fungal mancer meta and especially where people are likely going to be playing cards like Fungal Mancer and Blessing of Kings in Paladin decks, a certain density of Divine Shield minions matters more than what they are, because when you have enough of them, then one of them is going to stick. It's important to note a few things. First of all, Christology, two mana draw, two one attack minions from your deck, this is one of them. Kind of a big deal. And the card this reminds me of, you described it unassuming but effective, and swings the game in a way you weren't expecting, is Vicious Scalehide. One attack, lifesteal, annoying to deal with, probably attacks a couple times, Probably one of them is favorable. And Crystal Smith Kangor makes True Silver Champion really, really good. Because you gain four with each swing, and gain four twice is solid, especially when you're attacking. It makes Chill Blade Champion attack for three, gain six. Pretty great. It's enough of a difference in the healing that I think you'll find yourself being able to stabilize against decks where you normally wouldn't be able to. Because you think about the number of times that you lose to Zoo, where... They're almost out of cards, they got one left, and you're at five, and you know they're going to Doom Guard you. Because just that little bit of constant burst is keeping you at a low life total. Even, even Warlock does that to you, right? Where you stabilize, but you know they got the double Hellfire and you're at six. Making sure that you're at 10 instead of at six, or at 20 instead of 15, could really mean a lot. Especially if people are saying Mally Ghost Druid is going to be the new thing. If you can keep your life total around 30 against a deck that does chip damage but not major damage, 30 is a lot harder to deal than 20. A lot, lot harder, and especially with Christology, you can go and get this guy. He's different from what we normally see in Paladin. I do think that a 1-2 body in a Firefly candle shot format is harder to justify because that shield comes off a lot. But against a deck that doesn't have candle shot, this is gaining you 4 life, right? You're hitting it twice. It's gaining you 4 life. A 1-2 that gains you 4 life, it's not glamorous. It's not exciting, but it is serviceable and will be useful in some metas. And I think that there's a chance of seeing it if your life total matters in small increments. If it if it's only a shutter walk and deal thirty meta, obviously it's not going to be a thing. But I'd be surprised if we end up there. Can can we just create an app that I can download on my phone where I just speak into my phone and then Hat just translates my thoughts for me? It's called Twitter, bruh. <laughs> Because, I mean, you covered, like, everything that I was trying to say, except way better. All right. Anything you wanted to add, but Nope. Uh, All right. 
ha- good words stuff. It, <laughs> it's, am good words. Right, my cool. superhero Next secret card. identity is Spruce Wayne. I spruce things. Oh my gosh. Next card, Zarek, Master Cloner. Six mana, Priest, Legendary Minion. It's a 5-5. Five, five. It has Death Rattle. If you cast any spells on this minion, resummon it. That's, if it doesn't get silenced, that's a, that's quite a bit of value right there. Yeah, but it's six mana, five, five. In the past, we've seen cards like Thorason, but that was a must kill right away, and you didn't have to have any mana on top of it. The only card that I could see going with this really well that people have mentioned is Recurring Nightmare, because then Oh, you Vivid get... Nightmare. Oh, sorry, Vivid Nightmare. Yeah, Recurring Nightmare uh, is a very different wrong. card. Yes, yes. Wrong game <laughs> right. and century. G- kind of different. A little, I mean, there's returning stuff. It, doesn't matter uh so uh yeah but i don't think nine mana make a five five a five one that responds to five fives is anywhere near powerful enough but i i wouldn't be surprised if i that's potentially wrong but that that's kind of the only thing i could see really going with this obviously you can play this with some other some other minion buff cards but i feel like the inner fire priest is just going to have much better stuff to do than a card like this which is where a lot of people seem to be taking it this is going to be in some kind of if you need a value priest like this is this is cairn but you can make him cairnier more cairny i don't like the phrase appa is patron audio break if you don't know what Recurring Nightmare is, it was a broken card in the Exodus set of Magic the Gathering that involved bringing minions back from the dead. It was printed in 1998, 20 years before the age of this broadcast, and four years after Oppo was born, and I don't really care for that ratio. Fun fact, I'm looking Magic for a, than I am. I'm looking for a vomit emoji to put in the chat, and I can't find one. Yeah. Magic the Gathering is one year older than I am. So what we need to do is find the Jack Donaghy uh, infinite pouring whiskey emoji. That's where that's the gif. That's where I'm at. Anyways, to talk about the card. So this is this is a value minion. It's just not a thing that Priest usually does. So you'd have to make some kind of deck where Priest gets on the board and stays on the board, which has typically been Dragon Priest. And this can kind of be your Dracop discovering another Dracop, but it's really more like a Karen that just stays around. So it can be a powerful effect. I don't see this fitting into an archetype that Priest has traditionally had, and I think it would need a lot of support to have a reasonable mid-range Priest, because this doesn't play well with the Dragon cards, right? The Dragon... uh, I guess you could do Dragon Combo Priest. So I don't know. I, I hope there's something here, but it seems like a value card in a, in a class that doesn't need this kind of value. You could also res it with the three mana spell too, Twilight's Call. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool actually. Buff it, but, but then you, you're playing buff cards in a Twilight's Call deck doesn't sound very exciting to me. The payoff um, is just so marginal here when if yeah. that's what you're doing with... with Play a six mana five five, let it die, and then bring it back to get more five fives. I think comparing that to the the payoffs in the format already, like Dragon Color Alana, is just so much better at doing something like that while not dying in the process. Can we talk about Rogue, please? Please. Yes. Speaking of Rogue, Rogue Legendary. Is it is it Myra? Is that how how it's pronounced, or is it Mira? I think- I think it's Myra. All right. That's we're how I've with, heard of it. We're going to go with Myra. Myra Rot Spring. This card's super cool. It is a five mana rogue legendary minion. It's a four two. But it has Battle Cry, Discover a Death Rattle minion. Also, gain its Death Rattle. Yeah, y- y'all so, take it away. <laughs> so, Had and I say this every time a rogue legendary is previewed. Rogue legendaries are weird, and the weirder they are, generally they see end up seeing play. I don't know. This card just looks... I, I think it looks good. I know a lot of people are in our Discord especially have not been very excited about this card, but I was looking through Death Rattles earlier, and it just seems... Uh, it's unfortunate that there is such a bonus for getting rogue Death Rattle minions, because if it was neutral Death Rattles, there are so many good 
neutral death rattles and then even if you don't end up getting one you could get a cheap spell for or a cheap minion for combo activators I, i'm really excited to play with this card because i feel like it's going to perform a little better than it reads because five mana four two is very very weak stat line it trades with a lot of early game stuff but i, I just feel like the value and potential immediateness of having the death rattle there could end up making this card playable i i feel like I'm interested in playing this in Odd Rogue over, say, a, a Cobalt Scale Bane, but I'm sure people who have played a lot of Odd Rogue would say that's blasphemy, so I could be wrong. Yeah, I think this is one of those cards that is going to look pretty underwhelming or assuming or uh, unassuming until it's played against you and you're like, man, that thing's obnoxious right now. Because <laughs> I had this Spellbreaker that I had to use on this Edwin or something, and then I got this stupid, like, 4-2 that gives them like three one ones or something like even that's just annoying at that point and i think it's important to note i don't know i want to make sure people are parsing this card correctly it discovers a death rattle a death rattle minion then you get a copy of the death rattle in your of the minion in your hand you get a copy an extra and you put the death rattle on myra so the did not know that this card just got so much better for me. So, okay. Oh, you didn't know you get the no, card. No, I thought, you, I thought you just discovered the death rattle. Oh no, no that would be bad. That, no, that you get you so get a good. copy of the minion you discover, and you graph the death rattle onto Myra. So the important thing here is that it is effectively draw at least two cards, assuming the death rattle is worth a card, which it often is because frequently death rattle minions are costed so that the death rattle is the payoff. Now, a five mana four two is not a good stat line. It is a mildly presentable threat this card is best paired what you want to discover i think the most often edelweiss said it in our chat and i strongly agree cursed castaway which was from the witchwood it's a six mana five three with rush and death rattle draw a combo card from your deck so if you play myra on five and then it dies and you draw a vile spine and then you attack for six with the castaway next turn and kills and draw the second vile spine in your odd rogue deck it's either vile spine si or edwin those are the only combo cards you play or cold blood that's a lot of removal and a lot of burst. But if you're against aggro, you never want this card. This card is the shadow caster of this set. If you want a rogue that generates value in the middle of the game and the body is kind of okay sometimes, that is when you play this card. Shadow caster was not good enough because of the meta that it existed in. There was too much other broken stuff going on. If rogue has a viable value-based deck in combination with probably the other death rattle cards, which we're going to talk about, then this card is the linchpin of that strategy. But if Rogue cannot compete on a value basis, this card's not good enough if you're either uh, if you're being out aggroed. It just generates you value. Yeah, this card's sweet. I'm excited to play with it. Hopefully it's uh, somewhere in between as good as Nikolaius thinks it is and as good as I think it is. Because that would be a pretty good spot to be in. So, Nicholas thinks it's good or bad? I forget. He thinks it's bad. Oh. I think he thinks it's really bad. Okay. But that, that's just what I heard on Discord, so I'll have to ask him. So I, thought like this, I thought this card was serviceable before I realized it is a 5-mana 4-2, get a death rattle, draw a card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes it seem so much better. And draw a card with death minion. rattle. Which yes. also seems relevant when Death Rattle Rogue is probably going to be a thing. Anyways, the next card we're going to talk about here is a little buddy of ours called Mechathune. It's Mechathune, but Mechathune. 10 mana, neutral legendary minion, 10 10. It's a mech. Please note this next effect is a Death Rattle, not a Battle Cry. It is a Death Rattle. If you have no cards in your deck, in your hand, or on the battlefield, destroy the enemy hero. So, now that we've determined it's the best card in the set, what are you guys thinking about doing with Mechathune? The only thing I could think of is some funky Twilight's Call deck with Hemet, and you just Hemet your deck, and then play Cthun, or Mech Cthun, and then it dies, and then you play Twilight's Call, and no cards in hand, and uh, Spirit Lash or whatever and win. I think this just goes to show the kind of player I am or how I approach the game. But everybody I talk to about this card, 
thinks of like really cool combos and stuff that you could do to like get this to go off. And I'm just like, I'm just gonna put it out, hope I don't die, and cataclysm. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, that's the other one. You could play the new mech that reduces mechs in your hand by one. You could play two of those, and then you could play Mech Cthoon, Blood Bloom, Cataclysm. Also works. Props to Sean Smoker for being the first person I saw come up with that. And so what does it say about me that my first thought was innervate, naturalize, you lose? It's also pretty reasonable. But that tells it can me be... you played Tog Woggle Druid. Yeah, I, I Tog a Waggle on occasion. I occasionally Tog some Waggles. And soon I'm going to floop my Tog Waggle. Which is... I, I'm, I'm looking are, forward are to that. Are you going to play Gloop with it? It's, I, no. It's... <laughs> Yes, floop, no gloop. Come on, we have standards, Appa. And I think it's also, with Mechathune, I mean, uh, to be serious for a second, I think this card is probably not good enough because it's really hard to draw your entire deck and win before the other person draws their entire decks to win. And people talking about this as kind of this inevitable game ender that people have to play against in a fatigue deck, it's really, really hard to keep your own board super clear. It's really hard to not be dead by drawing 30 cards. And then it's really hard to kill it without them knowing, oh, they're playing the Fatigue Cthune deck. I will save any card that affects this unless you happen to have a game-ending combo. Now, fun one that I've heard is the Mech Resurrect spell Kangor's Endless Army with Mechathune, one of the missile launcher guys that deals one damage to every minion every turn. And then you equality, and then everything dies, and then you win. But it's so much work to set up, and you have to play everything and transform effects, ruin your day, or you're playing really narrow endgame combo cards that don't do anything until your opponent has had the chance to play every card. It's super fun. Really glad they printed a card like this. I I also think it's important to remember that it's not just about being in fatigue, like no cards in your deck, nothing on the battlefield. You also have to have nothing in your hand, which I think when people are coming up with like combos, that's like the the thing they think about the least. Like, even if you're playing, like, a, a Togwoggle shell, like, you get to the point where you're, you you have no cards in your deck, and then um, you, you play this on the board, but you also have to have nothing else in your hand, too, which is kind of important. Anyways, talk about Mechathune. Sweet meme card. Gonna be trolled in video. Yep. All right, right, let's let's get it let's get it moving here. The next card here is the Solarium. This is the Warlock Legendary spell. It costs one mana. It says draw three cards at the end of your turn, discard them. I thought Appa, based on a tweet that Appa made, that we were on different pages with this card, but uh, it seems that we're we're about the same. I think the card's good, but I don't think it's broken. It's definitely not ancestral recall, as somebody might have tweeted, but it's. Uh, Oh man. Anyway, there, there's another card that it's very similar to. Uh, I worry that the curve of Warlock decks is not as low as people think it is, and sometimes this is going to be just draw one of the cards unless you wait for a really long time, and waiting for a long time is not necessarily what the Zoo Warlock deck wants to do. I'm obviously talking about Zoo Warlock. I think that's where this fits. I don't see this in a discard Warlock deck or anything like that. I, I think in heal zoo, you empty your hand enough of the time that this will you'll probably get be able to play this and draw or play this and then play two cards off of it a reasonable amount of the time. Like say you have like six mana or something and you like start gassing out in the mid game instead of having to tap your hero power bunch, you have this in your hand, then you can play this, draw three cards, maybe play two of them. Um or like maybe you like high roll with like a happy ghoul fungal enchanter and then something else. Um, but but yeah, I think this is a definitely card built for uh, a zoo style deck and not a combo deck because I mean you discard the cards you can't play, you can't like sculpt your hand with it. You have to like play it and then unload them immediately. So they have to be pretty cheap. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It seems it seems fine. I think it'll see play, but I don't know how how good it'll be. Uh, Hat, any anything on this, or can I move to the next? I think this will be a card that's very difficult to evaluate and will face the fallacy of losing a card is worse than not having it to begin with. Um, if this is one mana, draw... If this is tracking, that's fine. This is one mana tracking, and I get the option of playing all three, and sometimes I'll play two of them. I, I will play tracking in most Warlock decks. Now... If you have Gul'dan in your deck and you depend on having it in some matchups, you just don't play this card. 
unpleasant, that's fine. It probably doesn't go in Q block. But in a lot of decks, this is draw three cards, play the best one of the three. That's good enough, and sometimes you play two, and in rare occasions you play three, and that's pretty great. But it's tracking you can't play on turn one, whereas tracking you can play sure. on turn one. Yeah, and if only Warlock had good one drops, one. like one that was your hero power, except also came with the two one. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, like it's not. I mean, it's never. We're never gonna have perfect comparisons because otherwise they'd be the same card. Uh, let's go on to the next card. This is the one that was spoiled in the video we all liked, called Luna's Pocket Galaxy. This is the seven mana Mage Legendary spell that says change cost of all minions in your deck to one. Uh, the most common thing I see about this has been people talking about Antonitis and killing our opponents. Uh, it seems good, but it seems kind of hard to pull off in one of those situations where if you draw the Antonitis, then you're talking about cards like Baleful Banker, putting it back in your deck, and that's kind of some nonsense I'm not really into. So uh, do you guys have a better use case for, for this card? I think it's sweet. I just don't think it's necessarily the best. I am probably the last person you want to come to to talk about building decks around <laughs> sweet combo cards. So. You can get it off Glyph. That is something I heard, and that is interesting for maybe an aggressive mage deck, because when you get to the later game and you're drawing a bunch of cards off of your weapon, off of Alaneth, then it gets more interesting. But uh, the cards in that deck are already fairly cheap, so I don't know how much of a discount you're actually getting and if this is worth it. But do you have anything that you were thinking for this card, Hat? Blister Guy made an excellent point about both this card and Academic Espionage, one of the rogue cards we're going to talk about later. That if you draw a one mana card and you play it and then you hero power and pass with seven mana floating, you did not get a discount. You got extra mana that you could not use. It was not worth it. So unless you have a way to play this and then get a bunch of minions in your hand, it is not worth it. Because when you have ten mana already, your deck should probably be built to play the best one every turn. Unless there's a way to draw a bunch of them and play them all at once and overwhelm your opponent with minions, it's, it's not relevant. The Druid quest reward also comes with a 5-mana 8-8 and also is in Druid, which is kind of a big deal because they have card draw. Mage doesn't have as much card draw as you think it is. You could play this with Alaneth, and that means you play a 6-mana card that does nothing to the board, then a 7-mana card that does nothing to the board, and then hope that you can play a bunch of other cards. I think the best combo with this card, I don't want to be dismissive, I think the best combo with this card is to make a golden rare with it. It's, I, it doesn't hit your hand. It's seven mana to do nothing to the board. Mage is not a class that has big payoff minions. It's not a class that has as much card draw as you think it does. And I just, I don't, it would have to be a pretty crazy combo. I'm done. Okay, that's enough about this card. Let's go on to the next one. This is Subject 9. This is a five mana neutral legendary minion Beast 4-4. Four, four. Beast is somewhat interesting. That has a battle cry of draw five different secrets from your deck. Worth noting that you can get this off of Rexar. I don't know that you want to get this off of Rexar, but that is an option. Um, it's neutral, so I, it goes in a couple different decks, but not that exciting to me. I don't have a lot to say about this. Do any of you guys have anything to say about this card? I don't know. Glacial Mysteries reduced with a 4 4 attached. Still, like, it doesn't even play them. I don't know. Like, the, the secret deck in the metagame right now is, like, Spell Hunter. I'm like, you don't, you don't want this. It's, it's a dude. Yeah. Or, it's or kind like of sweet a... in, in Wild because you have <laughs> Cloaked Huntress and you could play this and then Cloaked Huntress oh. a bunch of secrets. Eight and, mana yeah, play all the secrets nice in your deck? That's actually Glacial Mysteries. You just said <laughs> Glacial Mysteries. <laughs> Well, it's over two turns. This could be five. And then six, if you have coin, you could play that and putricide and then get just the full Christmas tree. <laughs> what what happened to you, Bodicus? Look, I, I see I'm getting into Boomsday. It's about all these experiments and projects and making all this cool stuff. You guys got to get into it. I haven't Boomsday. even been playing. Uh, I'm excited about Boomsday, but this card, along with a lot of other cards, are cashing in on people's nostalgia of how OP Mysterious Challenger was, forgetting that the OP part of that deck was the five turns of design mistakes before it. 
<laughs> when you start with Secret Keeper Coin Avenge into 3-2 Knife Juggler or Haunted Creeper or Shielded Minibot, God, the two drops are crazy, into Muster, into Shredder, into Sludge Belcher, then of course Mysterious Challenger is great. But people forget when all those cards went away, and Mysterious Challenger was unplayable in Standard for the rest of its time there. This is this effect we'll keep seeing get a bunch of secrets from your deck because people remember Mysterious Challenger, and that's a nostalgia well that's very deep. But this card is not a good card. Like, it's, it's just the effect right. is draw a bunch of things that you probably don't want to fill your deck with. Yeah, I think that's plenty of time on that card. We'll go into the Warlock Legendary minion called Dr. Morgan. It's an 8-mana minion that is a 5-5 five five and has a death rattle. Swap this minion with a minion from your deck. And that is really weird. And I don't know fully how to process it, because essentially, as long as you have minions in your deck, it's never dying, unless it gets silenced. Uh, but it's an 8-mana 5-5. Five five. And that stat line kind of sucks. So unless you're always pulling out Void Lords or something, I, I, I don't know about this card. Anybody else have a have an idea what to do with this? Isn't this like one. isn't this like Madame Goya? But, but you don't have to have a minion in play. You don't have to have a minion in play and it swaps within your deck when it dies, so it doesn't really die. Madame Goya is designed to cheat when it comes into play. This is designed to cheat value over the entire course of the game and on the way out. So it's similar but not quite the same. But you can still build your deck the same way where you abuse it. But I think you can abuse it a lot more easily because the additional value effect of Dr. Morgan means that you're going to still have another 5-5 later when that matters. And uh, if you're able to get Void Lords out or even Doom Guards, that's pretty good. Uh, I do think it is very... Particular Edelweiss in our chat is saying if you copy her, they find each other, and that is fascinating. That is pretty cool as long as you don't draw her, right? Yeah. Draw the second copy. But it gets that is pretty yeah. cool. Um yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to say say about that card. So I think we should go on to the Shaman Legendary spell. Appa, exciting Shaman Legendary spell. Costs seven mana and it says transform your minions into random legendary minions. I'm pretty happy that this does not combo extremely insanely with the shaman legendary minion. This doesn't uh, combo well with a board <laughs> full of minions. <laughs> it's just yeah. not good. Like, like random legendaries on average are super medium. Like you see legendaries. You see, you see the word legendary, and you're like, man, that's a lot of value. And then you start getting Nat Pagels and Lore Walker Chos, or like even just mid range stupid dudes that just like don't do anything. And you're like, man, this stinks. I put this deck, I put this card, my deck over like a bloodlust or something. What am I doing? Hey, uh, I've seen, I've seen Lore Walker Cho do work. Oh. <laughs> okay, so hold on a second though. If you have a bunch of one one sparks with Rush that turn into random legendaries, those are better than 1-1 one, one Sparks with Rush. You don't play this is, in a value deck. Correct. You don't play this in a, in, a, in a deck that's designed to, like, it plays a bunch of value minions that... that this is not Master of Evolution. You're not playing... Okay, you're not so, taking so, good minions to so better minions. in this scenario, this is predicated on having the weakest stat line in the game survive up until your 7-mana spell that you built your deck around that's a one of no, it's you have the you have the card that bots can talk about thunderhead which is the four mana three five that when you overload you get one ones it's super easy to go super wide and there's a lot of really big payoff battle cry minions serenite chain gang fungal mancer corridor creeper it's so easy to build a big board full of crap by cheating on so, mana cost so i will say this is kind of cool in a deck that's able to go super wide and kind of play with the evolve mechanic again like that deck was like pretty sweet um the problem is like, this is a one of it's really expensive um get get like at that point getting like mid-range minions as a low roll is like not a big deal at all you're just upgrading things at that point but the problem is like the shell around that is a little difficult to work with and then all you really well i mean you have bloodlust and thrall uh, death seer and then you could put this in there so this could go in in a, that style of deck it's just i think a question of is that style of deck 
really what you want to be doing with shaman right now and i'm not sure maybe but i i'm on opposite side i i think i think hat is there he's just kind of giving us the the uh other side the other point of view i do think that that is something you could do but if you just have these one ones I think you're probably better off just playing Bloodlust most of the time. You know, you can I mean, put I mean, more I, cards in your deck you'll, beyond yeah, Bloodlust. Ideally, you'll have like yeah. all of these different like go wide uh, payoffs in your deck, but it's it's just the question of like, um, is the format going to be conducive to allowing people to go wide? I, right. I think is the the real question. So, moving on to yep. floops, glorious gloop, gloop. <laughs> Uh, this is a one mana druid legendary spell that says whenever a minion dies this turn, gain one mana crystal this turn only. And that includes both players' minions, which is pretty relevant. Uh, oh, so it yeah. does. Yeah, so this seems like a card you want to play in a living mana deck, but I don't know. I, I worry about... I worry about your ability to have minions going into a turn where you can play this and make use out of all the mana you're getting. I don't I just don't feel like you need a card like this in a deck that's playing living mana, but I could be wrong. I mean, generating a lot of mana in a turn is uh is very good. It's something you really would like to do. So, um I don't know. I, I haven't had this one came out today. I haven't had a ton of time to process it, but uh, gaining mana crystals is scary. So maybe this card is scary, but I don't see it initially. Papa, what do you think? So with with this, I'm not like too scared of it because uh, for, for a card like this to like really do a lot of work, you it requires some setup and setup requires development and development requires the first few turns of the game happening already. So I don't see this doing like really busted things without uh, a prior investment. And at that point, you're already probably in the mid stages of the game. So uh, unless you're really trying to like flood the board and cheat up to UI with like token druid or something, I don't see this being too much of an issue. But I mean, I'm sure I'm missing some interactions with this card. It seems like it would be good in a deck that can go a little wide or develop a few minions and then play auctioneer and then do this it's like you gain a couple mana crystals you play a few more things like it, it has some applications but i i don't think i agree with the twitter consensus that this card's super nutty but i'm willing yeah. to eat a hat on that I'm to me it feels don't like eat me. <laughs> i'm not willing to eat this hat but i'm willing to eat i don't want to get eaten okay it feels like <laughs> just gonna to show me. Up. If you're attacking with a bunch of minions to generate mana from your gloop, why wouldn't you just play Savage Roar and kill your opponent? <laughs> so the only thing I could think of is if somehow you're playing this and then swiping and killing a bunch of your opponent's minions, which seems very unlikely, except in very specific matchups. Uh, but I I wouldn't be surprised if I was proven wrong. As I said, generating mana is very good. What, what do you think, Hat? Generating mana is very good. This has been Insights with Bodicus. It's, I, I mean, you're not wrong. And I do like the living mana combination. But the thing about Gloop, it feels like it's got the pilfered power problem. It works really great when you have stuff on the board and you get to dictate the trades. And that's a quadrant that we call winning. I... In order for this to really pay off, you have to need the mana and have the minions and not be killing your opponent or doing something else with it. I do think that there's a lot of good things to do with Druid in this set, and I don't... I'm not... Uh, Mally Druid's going to be good, whatever, but I don't think it's going to be broken. And the Druid deck I'm really thinking about is kind of the Triant Druid. But the one mana gain a bunch of mana right now if I have the board... I don't know is the direction I want to go in. I'd rather optimize the board by maximizing face damage. Or, I mean, I guess you can use this to do a bunch of trades in UI. That could be good. I could see that happening. I really see, like, the Dendrologist and Mulch Muncher and Landscaping deck where you're just constantly putting minions onto the board like old-school Token Druid. 
a one mana enabler that doesn't help you develop feels kind of like it only works when you already have the cards you need, and I'd rather just have the cards I need. And maybe I'm not seeing how the payoff works here, but I feel like in the deck where you'd want this effect, you don't want to spend the card slot on it, and you don't want to have this in your hand ever in the early game. Yeah, so I think that's plenty to talk about this. It's very interesting. We'll see if people are able to figure out uh, how to make this card broken, because it has that potential. Uh, we'll get into the last two here. Harbinger, Celestia. This is a four-mana neutral legendary minion, 5-6. That's a big stat line. And then after your opponent plays a minion, become a copy of it. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> uh, I mean, if your opponent's playing a bunch of huge minions and no small minions, then sweet. You get a 5-6 for 4. That's pretty good. But if your opponent's playing Fireflies, then this is really bad. And I think enough decks play Firefly that this is not a card that you want in your deck. Anybody have any objections to that? I'm going to echo that sentiment exactly. Man, I thought this card was really cool, and then you just took my sails and like, hey, you know that wind you had? <laughs> I don't like that sound. Okay, we're editing that out. Um... You can keep going. All right. So this last card, or this last legendary, is my favorite name of the set. There's a lot of great names in the set, but Flark's Boom Zooka. This is the Hunter legendary spell. It's eight mana. Summon three minions from your deck. They attack enemy minions, then die. I saw the deck that Chalky made with this in the reveal stream, and it looks sweet. Uh... I don't know how to make this card work to its most optimal uh, thing, but man, this card is cool. Basically, Chalky played it and caught Charge Devil Sword, Charge Devil Sword, uh, King Crush, and then played Abominable Blowman later and just got a bunch of big old beasts out that were charging and killing things. So the lots of cool things you can probably do with this with this spell. Um, and it's pretty good tempo because if you're putting this in your deck, that means you have a bunch of big minions in your deck in your deck that are going to attack their minions and kill them most likely, and that's cool. Uh, anything stand out to you guys right away, or do you want to get into the cards we have chosen? I want to get into the cards we talk we 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 chose. I think we all picked three to four cards to talk about. Uh, maybe not the ones that we thought were the best, but some that we thought were interesting that we wanted to go over. I want to. The only thing I want to say about Flark's Boom Zuka is that I think there would be a viable. Uh, you could make a podcast, a one-off podcast that was a tier ranking of the three syllables in this name, and everyone could have a different answer. And the arguments into which syllable was the best would be fascinating, because uh, they're all great. Do you Flark it? Do you Boom or do you Zuka? I might Zuka, but Flark is a close second. I think Boom is the worst, but also the most straightforward. See, this is content. It's content. This is content, but some better content is talking about cards that we want to talk about. I'm Excuse go me. <sighs> Just go ahead. Okay. Academic Espionage. I'm probably going to get crap for this, but this is a sweet card. I love this card. I don't know that it's very good, but it the power level is actually potentially quite high. Obviously, oh, I should say what it does. It is a four mana epic rogue spell that says shuffle 10 cards from your opponent's class into your deck. They cost one. So, hat. There's a card that we keep having a discussion about keeping in our opening hand. And if you want a card that makes me want to keep preparation in my opening hand, this is the one. Because prepping this out on turn one, that's what that's the first thing I want to do when I open my cards. I want to put this into a test rogue deck. It's going to be fun. I don't think it's going to be highly competitive. But I want to shuffle a bunch of cards into my deck and then draw a one mana five six seven eight nine cost card from my opponent's class and giggle because i think that would be sweet 
and I love this one. Okay, I'm disagreeing. The only thing about that sense I'm disagreeing with is <laughs> I want to prep this on turn six or seven after I play a card named Gadgets and Auctioneer. Because if I go gadget, coin, prep this guy, or on turn seven you prep it and then you play something else, the way I see this card, again, one one mana card at a time, if you don't have card draw, is not a discount if you pass with a bunch of mana floating. But what no, you just play sprint. You play sprint sure. in this well, deck. And see, the thing about Rogue that, that makes that argument that flips its on its head is that Rogue has a bunch of burst card drawing. And that's what's important here is that Miracle Rogue often needs a break glass in need of threat density. And that's what this card is. You play one burst of these. Rogue. The, the... <laughs> I hit him with it again. He wasn't expecting it. I got him. <laughs> I <wasn't ready> <laughs> Uh, Appa, why don't you talk? Because I have to think about the things we've done today. Uh, I mean, espionage looks like a meme. Doesn't look very yeah. good, but it looks like a meme. Looks like a sweet I meme. I mean, look, one cost, drawing a one cost expensive card and being able to play other stuff with it, I think is very powerful. Just think about drawing a five drop after playing this card, like a five mana spell from your opponent's class. It almost doesn't matter what it is. Getting it for one mana is is a very, very good deal. Even getting some of the two mana cards for one mana is a big deal. We've talked about that kind of discount. And just having cards to activate your combo stuff, I, I would not sleep on this card. Also, playing this with, uh, with Elven Minstrel and being able to draw one mana minions that you got off of this card, I, I, I just... I, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a meme, but I think it's going to be a really fun meme that can win games of Hearthstone. So I'm excited about it. Uh, I, instead of me going through all my cards, let's go to Hat. You can talk about your first card. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring this up here because I wasn't expecting that. I put the cards in the order they were in the document, and then you changed the order on me. So now I'm discombobulated. Do you want me to just go with my no, card? No, no, then? No, no. Your, your APM is being tested. Hey. Uh, I'm I'm fine. My micro is on point. We're going to talk about Juicy Psycho Mel. Ju juicy? Say that five times fast. I can't say we're that talk, one we're time. We're talking about Juicy Fruit. Let's talk about some Juicy Fruit. Juicy Fruit. fruit. Okay. It's, this is literally Juicy Fruit, by the way. The juiciest of fruits. This is Juicy Psycho Melon. Four mana, Druid Epic Spell. Draw a 7, 8, 9, and 10 cost minion from your deck. And this card is touted as one of the cards. That's the reason that Druid is broken again. I remember... And we all remember, middle set last year made Druid really good, because it printed 5-mana Spreading Plague and Ultimate Infestation. Now, it turns out the reason those cards were broken, well, Spreading Plague was the reason Spreading Plague was broken, but the reason that UI was grave is because you played it on turn 4, because Innervate is really good. So, Juicy Psycho Melon, what it's saying is you're trading... An early game developmental play, and, and really it doesn't even have to be early game, it can be mid game, it still costs you four mana and doesn't affect the board. Druid is better at spending this sort of thing. But drawing all your combo pieces is not really the thing that Druid struggles with in my experience. You might have some games where you lose because Mally's in the bottom five. You might have some... Uh, with Togwaggle Azelina, it's never a thing because your deck is built to draw the whole thing. So it's only if you're playing a... Uh, like the Mali deck, and you need specifically the Mali, and a card that gets you a second copy is worth investing four mana in. Or if you're playing a version of Big Druid where you just want to brute force the opponent, this is four mana, draw four cards. And that's fine. But again, when I talked about this, uh, the set earlier in the in the podcast, I said this is the set that incentivizes aggro to exist with worse cards because the control on control payoffs are so much better that people are going to be shooting for going over the top of each other, which leaves more room for people to go under them. This card competes with Branching Paths in the early game, and I think you still have to play Paths. This card competes with Oaken Summons. It competes with powerful anti-aggro cards that are less relevant in a meta that's more controlling. And I think if you start seeing this card played, you bust out your Poison Blades, and you start hitting people in the face, and they get punished for playing cards like this, unless we get to the point that Druid is truly so powerful that aggro can't top out cards and you need anti-control answers more than you need a balanced deck with universal responses. And if that's the case, and if this card starts seeing a lot of play, 
It means there are balance issues elsewhere, and this card is a symptom but not the cause. In a balanced meta where Druid cannot effectively beat wide aggressive aggro decks, and you see this card a lot, there's something else going on that can be corrected. But this card will never be the cause, it will be a symptom. So I don't have anything to say about this for standard, but I've watched Taylor play a lot of Wild, and Togwoggle Druid is one of her favorite decks that she plays. And I mean, this this is just a, the perfect card for it. You just stick it in there over like, you just pick a card, you take it out, you put this in, then it's just immediately better. Because <laughs> it just tutors the entire combo. And like, there there are a lot of games in Wild where you you have to alternate between clearing the board or drawing like in the in the in like the mid game around like six seven mana so you play this on turn four and then you start developing later on then you have the combo in your hand already so this is definitely perfect for wild tog woggle druid i have no idea its application in standard and that's all i'm gonna say on that yeah i have no comment about this card i i don't think it was as good as a lot of people seem to think it was but probably has a place especially in wild uh appa let's go to your card hopefully hat saw where i was going with this and he's gonna have this one ready to go this nah man one... i'm all mixed up you have me topsy turvy <gasps> that's the card that's the card we're talking about that, that, that's the boomstick card no we're not <laughs> we're not uh. so my my card is topsy turvy that i chose it's a zero mana pre-spell is extremely unassuming and it it swaps a minion's attack and health it is zero mana just sw- crazed alchemist something basically and you might be wondering why is this on your top cards to look at so the reason is because divine spirit inner fire priest was a very very good deck a couple minutes ago whenever dragon priest was still very very good and the the reason it's not very good right now is pretty much twofold i think um so the the problem is it doesn't have like that great of a shell to build the combo around whenever it lost dragon and operative and those kinds of cards it, it lost a good chunk of its power but and 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 then the the sorry i'm losing my train of thought but the second part of it is that skulking geist is actually a really big part of this meta so getting your inner fires uh, taken away with with Skulking Geist is a really really big downside to playing the the combo priest deck, and to comp to combat that, combo priest players have played Crazed Alchemist or Void Ripper in the past, and while those are fine and serviceable, they're they're still really clunky and trying to combo out in one turn. I know Bodicus can probably back me up on this because I think we played combo priest a lot more than hat has and i know i played a ton of it a few months ago but it you you can get really constrained on mana really quickly when you're trying to otk somebody so having to spend that two or three mana from a void ripper or a craze alchemist while you're trying to combo can be the difference in like whether you can win the game on a turn or not so having having a zero mana on defect inner fire essentially when you're trying to otk somebody is really really good and the fact that you can tutor it with Shadow Visions is, makes it even better. So th- that's why this is my pick, um, my, my top pick to look out for, is that I think it might give Combo Priest enough gas to be relevant again. Yeah, I as soon as Appa said Skulking Geist, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, I didn't really consider that. And then I didn't really consider this in Combo Priest, and it just, he makes a lot of sense. Appa's real smart, and I, uh, yeah, this card seems like a great one of to have in your deck that you can Shadow Visions for, and not just auto-lose to Skulking Geist. So I like it a lot. I think you still want to play an Inner Fire. I think you said that. Uh, you still probably want to play an Inner Fire for the trades and the yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I think you still want to play, like, two Inner Fires, uh, and probably just one copy of this, maybe even two, if you want just like more consistency to burst them down. Uh, you still you still want your inner fires for like mid game pushes and stuff. But I think I think this is a nice tool for the deck. Perfect. All right. Uh, a lot of times you win by inner firing minions in the mid game for trades and to present your first big threat. And I think that this just allows you both the opportunity to beat Geist and be more flexible with how you use your combo cards while also having a slightly faster 
uh, way to to combo off in matchups where speed matters. Great. All right. Next card is going to be my second card, which is this is my most competitively viable card that I want to talk about. It's well, it's technically two cards, Thunderhead and Voltaic Burst. Thunderhead is a four mana epic shaman minion that is a three five that says after you play a card with overload, summon two one one sparks with rush. And Voltaic Burst is a one mana rare shaman spell that says summon two one one sparks with rush and overload one. I think these both go in the same type of deck. I think this is a pretty cool Bloodlust deck. Uh, both of these cards just seem very strong to me. Uh, I'm pretty excited to try out Aggro Shaman as as a potentially very viable deck in after the rotation, or I guess after the new set comes out. So I'll be exploring this a lot. Uh, it feels like... Um, Man, I can't remember the Shaman Legendary Minion, but it feels like this is a kind of shell that this goes in, and I, I'm pretty excited to try out these cards. They seem very powerful. I know Hat really wanted to talk about these cards, too. Super high on Shaman, and I think that this card in particular allows a Bloodlust, Thrall, maybe even a Stormbringer Shaman to exist. And the idea of playing Thunderhead and Zap is so si 70 that I just can't resist building something with it. And the Shaman card... Is... It's like Backstab SI7, because you get the 2-1. Yeah. It's 4 damage. It's pretty sick. And if you happen to have a little card that Shaman plays sometimes called Flame Tongue Totem, that's really, really good here. And I thought that these cards... I thought these sparks went away at end of turn, and they don't. So all you have to do to make this card competitive with Violet Teacher is probably about 2 ticks in the game. And you can play... A lot of really, really good cards that were printed this set, or Lightning Bolts, or Zaps, or uh, the the new Voltaic Burst, and just one Lightning Storm. And that's enough overload that you're probably generating a lot of 1-1s. It's like Wisp of the Old God Token Druid, where one of the spells by itself was garbage, but at a certain density, it became too much for your opponent's removal, and the last one was what killed them, and you kept playing Threat Generators until they couldn't deal with one. So... I'm going to pitch you a scenario, and then you're, you're going to think it's real juicy. So you play Thunderhead on four, and then it lives, and then you play Feral Spirit to follow it up. That's and they don't they don't get bored ever again for the rest of the that game. That is a value gasm, and there's a, so many ways to do it. And also, have you heard of? I want to tell you about two cards that go in this deck. One is named Unstable Evolution, and the other is named Corridor Creeper. Just just throwing that out Horror there. Corridor Creeper, that's nice. And the third one is named <laughs> Sea Giant, by the way. All right, we're doing oh, it. We're doing oh, it. Oh, man, this deck is sweet. Right? I mean, all right. Keep going. Keep going. Let's well, go. Yeah, let's let's go, Hat. Second card. I'm bringing up the image. I didn't pee again, I promise. Okay. All right, so the, my second card here that I want to talk about is called Weapons Project. It's a warrior two-mana spell. Each player equips a 2-3 weapon and gains 6 armor. Warrior has not recovered from the loss of Fiery War Axe. It is the card with the least class direction. It is the card with the most confusing design. Or the class with the most confusing designs. But this card gives me a lot of hope. If you are thinking, I give my opponent a 2-3 weapon and I gain 6 armor, well, don't I just take 6 damage? You know what? You're right. It's just a 2-3 for 2. That's great. Because Warrior needs early game removal, and a 2-3 for 2, in some scenarios, especially in wide board matchups, is better than a 3-2 for 2. Now, Stormforged Axe is a fine card. That is a 2-mana 2-3 weapon with overload for 1. Yep. That's all I'm going to say. And so, the armor you give your opponent, if you're playing this, this card, it is likely irrelevant. The board control you gain with it is great. You can theoretically destroy a weapon with it if you're feeling saucy. Playing it against Odd Rogue, obviously not ideal because they deadly poison you and bad things happen. But it's still, you can destroy a deadly poison, uh, poison dagger and you just give them something like that. It's, it's mid-rangey. The 6 armor is going to balance out with the 2-3 weapon almost all the time. This should be viewed as generally a 2-3 weapon for 2. And if you would play a 2-3 weapon for 2 in Warrior... You probably want to play this card, and I think Warrior often wants to play that. 
and there's a lot of really nice warrior mid-range minions. The the one mana one three, the new mech armor smith, I really, really like. And I think there's an option there for Warrior to have something competitive, at least to control the board into the middle of the game. And this card is a big part of that. I don't have a lot to say other than I like this card a lot. And that's it. It's nice. I like it. The, it, the, it leads to uh, some cool deck building things you can do with it as well, like having Harrison Jones in your deck and drawing a couple extra cards or Ooh. having oozes in your deck. Yeah. There, Seven mana, of, gain six, cool equip things. a two through weapon, draw three cards. I mean, even you could just play play this and then play Harrison the next turn and draw two cards. They they get one swing out of it, but you might not even have anything to swing at. So uh, it's there's there's a lot of cool things you can do with a card like this. I'm I'm a big fan. If Weapons this, Project this Harrison is, was a newsletter, I'd subscribe. This is gonna be when I play it. It's gonna be Weapons Project the Twig Breaker. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna be doing with it. That's also that's also sweet. Break that. Break a Skullaminari. Break an Aluneth. Yeah, there's just a bunch of different little corn case applications yeah. that like make it a lot better. Like the more you think about it. Oh, break um, a Kingsbane. And then they just play Shiny yeah. Finder and it comes back. <laughs> <laughs> so so my second card, moving on here, is Spirit Bomb. This is Goku's Invitational card, and uh, this is a two mana Warlock spell. It says deal four damage to a minion and your hero. And the reason I picked this is because it is slots just directly into even Warlock. Uh, it doesn't have any good removal on turn two. We're playing cards like Doomsayer's fine. We're playing Stubborn Gastropod. Uh, the earliest removal in the deck really is uh, Lesser Amethyst Spellstone and Hellfire. And the downside of this card is not actually really too much of a downside in the deck because you want to lower your life total for Hooked Reaver, you want to lower your life total to trigger your spell stones. Uh, it's a really nice tempo gain card uh, in the early game. It's just, it's it's even Warlock. It needs it, it gets it, it's going in the deck. It's good. This, All of those things are good. This just I seems... Like what I said. Just, like... Two mana kill target Tench Clan Thug. Like just, just. Ooh, we like killing those. Those uh, things hit us really hard. It just seems, for a deck that wants to lose life and kill things, this does both, and makes your spell stones gain you the life back and kill things. All right, if this card doesn't see heavy play, I'd be surprised. Yep, seems sweet. All right, last round here. Really fast, I I put in another meme card, which I guess <laughs> put, lets you guys know where my head's at with this set. But it's Necrium Vile. The it's a five mana epic rogue spell. It says trigger a friendly death rattle, friendly minions death rattle twice. Uh, I just want to pitch to you guys the scenario. At some point in the game, we're gonna play Leroy or a cube and shadow step it, and then we're going uh, with ten mana. We're gonna play Leroy, attack them. And then play cube on the Leroy, and then prep out this card, and that's thirty damage. That was it. Cube is probably <laughs> going to be determined as the root of all evil by the time it leaves standard. Yeah, uh, but I, I just thought this card was cool, and I couldn't think of another card. I figured you guys would talk about other cards, so I I had thought about that little combo. I'm sure many other people had already thought about that as well, but it's kind of Kind of a fun little OTK that I was thinking of. I mean, this card's the meme. Card this card's the meme, but I think that the three mana three two weapon that triggers death rattle once in Rogue is really really good. Um, my third card, Copper Tail Imposter, four mana four four Mech. It is a neutral common battle cry. Gain stealth until your next turn. If Mech decks works, this will be in every single one of them. Stat efficient is gonna survive to get buffed. Tax are four and can't be targeted. And when you play this into war gear, that's nine. Turn four, thing you can't kill. Turn five, take nine. If that is not good enough, then mechs are not good enough. If mechs are ever good enough, this card is going to be in every single deck that mechs are in. Final answer. All right. 
Moving on? Yeah. Yeah. Nine you. Nine. card. (laughs) Yep. Nine is a lot. That is... Nine is greater than eight and less than ten. (laughs) That's my final answer. uh, Yes. All right, so... I agree with you. So my card... Okay. (laughs) So, So my card that I do think... That, that's a mech that I do think is good enough is I think the, the most unassuming card on this list. It is Glowtron. It's a one mana paladin. It's a mech. It's a 1-3 with magnetic. As we've talked about on the show many, many times before, a 1-3 body is good enough by itself. Doesn't need any other stats. The the tribe like the 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 tribe on it doesn't really matter all that much. But this is just a 1-3 with upside. And this, I think, is going to slot very nicely into a deck that needs one drop help. And that is Murloc Paladin. And you might be thinking, what? Why? Why is this stupid 1-3 mech going to go on Murloc Paladin? Well, their curve is kind of mid- mid-range heavy right now. With uh, They're really heavy at 3 and 4, and they need to lower the curve. And they don't have very, very many good one drops. This is just a solid one drop on its own. And then it attaches to Nightmare Amalgam in the mid game. Which is which is a nice little bonus for it. All it would need to be playable is just the one three and be able to attach to a second copy of itself to be completely fine. But the fact that this also attaches to amalgam makes it even better on that deck. So I, I think this one's looking real nice for Murloc Paladin. Yep, that all makes a lot of sense. I I think this card's pretty solid. Also, I, I think could very easily go into Odd Paladin. I mean, you. It already played Dire Mole in a lot of those decks, and this is better than Dire Mole in the majority of circumstances. So, yep. Seems one mana, like one threes. Card. One mana, one threes break the stat curve because it's generally the equation you want is you take the cost, you double it, and you add one. One mana, one threes trade well, get buffed well, beat the stat curve. If it has a marginal upside, then it's usually worth it. If it has a major upside, it's usually broken. Glowtron has a, has a between those two. But I think there will be a lot of times where you stick something to it or stick it on something, and it'll be worth it. It's just it, it, it's just power word shield, where instead of the card, you get plus one, plus one. It's cool. You're in a minion base deck. Yep. So what decks? Snap call. What is the first deck you theory crafted that you're going to jam day one? Okay, so my deck was the Academic Espionage text, Test deck, but the close second was actually a wild deck, which is more memes, but it's Glinda plus Ziliax. Is that the, is that the legendary thing that magnetizes and gives charge and lifesteal and taunt and divine shield? Yeah, that one, and... Oh my gosh, I should know these. I should have known. I, I have. I knew them in my head. But the two mana, two, three, that reduces your mechs by one. Uh, I want to see if that... Two mana, that one, will, two. Will, will, will two Zilli mana. Oh, Mech rush. Warper. No, you're talking about Mech Warper. Mech Warper, yeah. yeah. So you go Glinda, Mech Warper, Mech Warper, play five Mech Warpers, and then you have a free Zilliax. And I think you can just magnetize it and make infinite-sized Mech Warpers. That's... Correct and disgusting. Yeah. Rush, so but not charge. In, yeah, you play it in Reno Lock, and it's just a way that you win, I'm sure, a lot of matchups in Wild. Or that you could win a lot of matchups in Wild, I would think. So if that was in but, a Trollden you know. video, is that Epic Sax Guy or Guile's theme? Definitely Epic Sax Guy. Yeah. I, I can see a Guile's theme, but yeah, that's really good. Hoppa? So what about you, Hap? Me. What do you make uh, I've already built the Thunderhead deck with Corridor Creepers. And, like That was the first list that I theory crafted, so there's a lot of answers that I could give here, but that would be the accurate one. That's that's definitely the deck that I'm, that I'm going to throw together day one. So for me, I'm not good at building cute combos and like decks with cool interactions with them. I either go super heavy control or just like build a solid aggro deck, and I'm just... I'm just going to build Murloc Paladin. I'm just going to hit people with Murlocs. 
and gain a bunch of free ranks while people are doing silly things. I'm just going to go Murgle or Murgle. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open these Glowtrons and get to work. That sounds like a good plan. I will probably do that when the set releases, but at the pre-release, I want to make all these meme decks and meme around a bunch. Isn't Hopefully the pre-release I open the cards. deck recipe only? No, you can open all of your pre-release packs and play with those. There's two different modes. You can either play with the pre-made decks or you can play with cards that you open. But you can only... I'm pretty sure you can only open the bundle cards. But okay. that's the way I understood it. Let's go. Uh, let's go to the outro. There's a question. Ask it. Hat with your thing and the button and the go. So before I do that, I have something very important to share. We've gotten some information from some of our listeners. We had originally said the pre-order bundle is available for purchase till August 30th. There's some confusion in that language. We want to make sure you're aware of this, and we're gonna tweet it out as well. That the website says. The Boomsday will be out by August 30th. Doesn't specifically say that the pre-order is available to the 30th, to August 30th, even though we know the set comes out August 7th. It says the set will be out by August 30th, even though they announced the date of August 7th. We don't know because we haven't gotten an answer via Twitter, even though we've had people ask when the pre-order will be available to. So we're going to make sure we revise our previous news item if you're waiting to buy the pre-order until after the set comes out, you may not be able to. It's worth doing now if you have the ability to do that, just to make sure. Just to make sure. Because if it were to not be available after the 7th, I think the website's a little unclear in that. But the important thing is making sure that you're okay as a listener, and that you get the cards if you're waiting for the cards, and not that you depend on us to make sure that you wait till the 30th, that you can that you can get it later. We don't know 100% that it's still going to be available. And unfortunately, any questions we've asked have not been returned with definitive answers. So please be careful. And if you need the pre-order, you should probably get it sooner rather than later. And then... How long can this go on? That's the question Bodicus wanted me to ask. And I don't want to ask... I don't want to ask things. I want to say things. That's what I want to do. Thanks to Stefan L for letting us use his cover. Check him out on his channel link in our show notes. Big thanks to Hearthstone Top Decks and Beerbrick.com for decklists and Hearthstone Tournaments on YouTube for tournament VODs. The show notes for this week's episode are on our website, coinconcede.com. You can support our show at patreon.com slash coinconcede. Join us every week live by following us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash coinconcede podcast. Join the community chats in our Discord at discord.coinconcede.com. And right into our email at coinconcede at gmail.com. We'll be reading those over on our bonus episodes. Follow us on Twitter at coinconcede. If you'd like some CC swag, head on over to our shop at shop.coinconcede.com. Big thanks to our producers, Viriatus, Arrow, and... It's so fluffy! So, who wants to coin concede first? I'll, I'll, I'll do my oh, coin concede. You go. So first is to Viriatus. I, I already talked about it earlier in the show, but I just want to reiterate that. We're definitely happy to have you back. And then I want to coin concede to the Golden Gore Hell that I opened on EU because that turned into my golden prep for my my last golden card that I needed for fully golden Miracle Rogue on EU. So, so thanks, Gore Hell. <laughs> Your sacrifice is much appreciated. Word. Bodicus. So I got to meet Rosty at the Innkeeper's Quest this weekend, and he is a really cool dude. We got to play a game. He was just super positive and really happy and really great to talk to. So I want to coin concede to him for making my experience there at the Innkeeper's Quest a good time. And uh, yeah. Yeah, he seems like a really, uh, really level-headed guy and very, very good at freeze mage, if I recall correctly. Um, I want to give some coin concedes out. We've got a few. First, Nikolaius, who, by the way, is our newest cast and crew member because he is joining the coin concede cast as a coach for our patrons. So we're very, very excited to have him on. He was grinding top 100 legend. Last I checked, I don't know where he finished. I think it was in top 200 for sure. 
Do you guys know if he finished top 100? He didn't post in season goals, so I don't know where he finished. I'm going to ask him and then overdub this. Um, but Nikolai, he was grinding top 100 legend like two days ago. So he's really, really good. And he is signed on as a coach. And he's been a part of our community for a very long time. So we're super thrilled to have him on. He's, he's hosted a couple of episodes. He's a great guy and available for your patron coaching needs. And he's also available on Gamer Sensei if you want to get him outside of the podcast. So coin conceit to him. Vicious Syndicate for their AMA on Reddit and talking about very clear and transparent discussion of how their data works and the and the experiences that they've had. And Zach O from Vicious Syndicate was the one who ran the AMA and really great answers, super informative, super interesting. And then Steven Sensei for both talking about, he brought up the BM thing for us to talk about in the show today. And uh, he just went back and listened to episode 91 from a year ago. And there's some goofy stuff in here. It was six weeks before KFT came out. No announcement had been made yet. And some fun things that he noticed. Well, turn one, Vicious Fledgling was still very good. We had just learned about the card pack and quest rogue changes. So that was back when you wouldn't get the duplicate legendaries. Oppo specifically said he's not going to have to talk about quest rogue anymore. Little did he know. I, I like how I said that. And then I ended up spiking a tournament with the nerfed quest rogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the first nerf, not the second nerf. Yep, yep. But also, you said, never blame a loss in RNG. Learn from it and figure out why and focus on what you have agency over. Still the same. And uh, and there's some there's some great quotes here. So props to Steven for taking that trip down memory lane. It's uh, I might go back and listen to some old episodes, too, just when I feel nostalgic. It's, uh, it was great. So thank you very much, Steven, for doing that. And that is... All the time we have, where can we find you, Bodicus? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at BodicusHS. Uh, you can follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Bodicus. I'd say there is about a let's go 60% chance that I'll stream this weekend. Because I'm going to be playing a lot of Hearthstone over in the next week or two. So uh, try to get a stream up for you guys then. I haven't streamed on the new rig yet, so I got to get that all set up but it should be pretty easy. Appa? So you can find me on Twitter at Appa underscore HS. Um, usually I'd plug my Twitch, but I don't foresee a Twitch stream anytime really soon, honestly, because I got work kind of filling up most of my schedule. And then between that is like writing articles, playing in Challenger Cups and all that kind of stuff. So just... On Twitter at Appa underscore HS for now. And then in any of our like the Coinkency Discord, Valence Chosen Discord, all that kind of stuff. I'll 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 be in there. And you can find me on Twitter at Ridiculous Hat, on Twitch, twitch.tv slash ridiculous hat. And in Discord where Hearthstone is discussed, you can probably find me and Steve talking about comma separated values, among other things. And that's our show. Appa, why don't you send us out? Come on, man. I can't say that. Say it. Do it. Do it. All right. Hat hat changed the sign off for this week, so I'm, I'm just going to roll with it. I know what you could do. You should, you should go. Keep calm and boom, stay on. Keep and calm and boom, stay on. <sighs> if you see us on ladder, coin concede. I'm not saying I'm not. We're not whispering. We're not whispering. Keep coin calm. Concede. Don't whisper. And coin concede. Coin concede. Coin concede. <laughs> Take cold comfort in your victory. You win. I can rest now. You win. For now. Your victory proves nothing. The day is yours. I choose death. You have triumphed. This time, this heart is yours.